7 o'clock, your time check brought to you by Clarkson Jewelers, an officially licensed Rolex jeweler with Brooke Grimsley and Danny Mack. I'm Randy Carricker. Matthew Rocchio is also here, and it's great to have you with us on a Taco Tuesday morning. Good morning, Brooke. How are you? Good morning. I'm doing great. How about you? Good. I didn't have tacos for breakfast, and I uh. missed the Choco Taco. Just two little taco references all right off the bat. I What's a Choco it. Taco? Oh, it You've was, never had one? It, I've never had one. Uh, it, I'm so, assuming it's got chocolate in it. it oh, does. you're right. Choc- Choco Taco was at Taco Bell, and I think they had them at various and sundry other places. But it was like a waffle cone taco shell with ice cream and then a hard shell cover chocolate. It was delicious. Is there a uh, food you don't know about? Oh, no. Dan. No. <laughs> no, Dan. I, I know pretty much every food. I know the good. I know the... Uh, the bad and the ugly? Well, I, 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 the bad and the ugly is liver. Uh, <laughs> Randy, so, yeah. uh, the Flash Fox Business two days ago. Oh, 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 Choco Tacos returning this summer after partnership between Taco Bell, Salt, and Straw. Yes. I'm a happy guy today. This Thank that made you. my day. That it should, because <laughs> it's a so Taco happy. Tuesday, and now we know that Choco Tacos are back. Oh, oh and those oh, that is like the best in high school. That is the best treat to get. That w- I would get that all the time. Do you remember it was just a week ago you talked about your heart issues? Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. I just want to throw that out there. <laughs> oh, you can have Be moderation. Concerned. You can have moderation, Dan. It right. doesn't mean you have to completely avoid Choco Tacos or Taco Bell. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> well, and there's always a way that you can make it healthy, right, Randy? I mean, you have your dairy. That's what right. What else? What are some other? Well, you, you know, would think that in a uh, in a waffle cone shell, you'd have flour, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you've got to have what? What would our vegetable be in this? Uh, it's got to be a sneaky one in there. Yeah, there really does. Corn syrup or something like that. Corn, right? <laughs> Corn! Um, and then, uh, what am I leaving out? There's no protein. There's no protein in the Choco Taco. You said there's ice cream in this? Yes, there is. Well, you got dairy. Yeah, yeah that's taken care of. Okay. Yeah, yeah dairy's good and, and uh, starch is good, but... Uh, I think we're missing out on, and we'll figure out a fruit and vegetable. We'll throw corn in there, but there's no protein there. We, and we aren't putting any, you know, peanuts in it or anything like that. Maybe they put peanuts on top. I don't know. Ooh, you could. Protein. There we yeah. go. Okay. So this is a good thing. Happy Taco Tuesday, everybody. Blues lost to Toronto yesterday. Uh, Blues just with no respect for the American presidents. Uh, they fall to Toronto. How is it that Toronto plays harder on a day with for that honors the U.S. presidents than the the, the American based team does. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even think about that, right? That's Four not two. a good look, right? Yeah. No, it's not. Four two is the final. No respect whatsoever. Uh, but the Blues will be back in action against the Islanders tomorrow night uh, on two twenty two. Can you guys figure out who the Blues are yet? Uh, they're mediocre, no. Dan. Yeah, they are. Uh, they're a team that uh, I mentioned it uh, before we started the show. If you look at the three stars of yesterday's game. Austin Matthews was number one. He would, he's the best, one of the three best players in the league. He'd clearly be the Blues' best player. Mitchell Marner was the second star of yesterday's game. He would be the best player on the Blues. And William Nylander was the third star of the game, and he would be the best player on the Blues. John Tavares, who was not one of the stars of the game, would be the best player on the Blues. And Morgan Riley, pretty darn good. He'd be one of the two or three best players on the Blues, if not the best. And, and he didn't play yesterday. Yeah, and he's still suspended. And the last time the Blues faced them, Marner was out of that game. And you're missing Riley that you mentioned mm-hmm. as and well. Tavares too. And I think it's just really interesting, though. What do you think is missing in, the, in these last four games that we're seeing specifically compared to the previous eight where they were doing so well for a stretch there? It's shooting the puck, in my opinion. They had 63 shots, only 21 hit the net. The Leafs blocked uh, 27 shots in their two games against Toronto. They've averaged just 18 shots on goal, mm-hmm. and that's not enough. If no. you get more shots on goal, some of those find the back of the net. I would say the other thing is they failed to win the third period against Nashville. They mm-hmm. failed to win the third period yesterday afternoon. And if you don't come with everything you've got with as inconsistent as the Blues are, you're just not going to win games. Well, and we mentioned it yesterday, Dan, in the Saturday game, Ryan O'Reilly's effort took over in the third period, and that is an issue. If the Blues, especially in the third, aren't exhibiting effort, and they've fallen apart, they fell apart yesterday, they fell apart against Nashville, uh, effort-wise, then you're you're done. You're, you're you're kind of screwed. Well, the other part that you talked about is depth, and depth in scoring is a real problem with this team. The Hayes and sideline had two shots on goal. They ain't yeah, gonna cut it, right? And that is, see, there you go. That's that's a, a third line that, for most good teams, would be a fourth line. That's my point. Depth yeah. on this team. Yeah. The third period is what's really just concerning to me. In these last two games, as you mentioned, Dan, 
they've been outscored six to two. And you look at that game yesterday in the third period, it was tied one to one and the Blues then allowed two special teams goals. I don't really know what that means when it falls apart so quickly for them in that third period and they can't seem to gain some ground again. Well, I, I look at this. It's a really interesting time if you're Doug Armstrong and his staff. You've got eight games to go before the deadline, which is March 8th. I don't know, Caspery Kapanen, Marco Scandella, Oscar Sundquist. I mean, maybe you get back some mid-level picks with those guys, but it, it's really an interesting time. Is is We're talking about it. Who are the Blues? They're inconsistent at this point, but what do they do at the trade deadline to make the playoffs or to say, we'll go with the group we have. We may give up some, you know, peripheral guys on our roster and take our chances or do you say we'll add maybe a player or two I would doubt that they yeah. would do that but you know you'd love to get in the playoffs and see what they could do but they've got eight games to go before March 8th I think I'd be inclined and Scandell is a team that can help a playoff team he I agree. Is a sixth depth defenseman I don't know if Kapanen is going to be a guy that helps out a, a playoff team Oscar Sundquist is pretty valuable here. If I were the Blues, I'd be inclined to try to re-sign Sundquist and keep him around. And if he wants too much, and I don't think that would be the case, I think he likes St. Louis enough so that he would stay. Uh, I, I think that I would keep Sundquist around if I were the Blues. What about Pavel Buchnevich? Is he a name that you see possibly being moved? I can see that. He's got a year left. The problem is you better, Snuggaroo better be pretty good next year, right? Yes. Because you need to have, uh, Pavel Buchnevich, even though he's not having a great year, He's, he's, he's still been really bad, I think, yeah. in the last, like, 10 to 15 yes. games. Yeah. He has not played well. So you have to get the most out of that talent. And if you can get a number one for him, then I would be inclined to move him, too. There was a rough power play with Buchnevich holding the puck, and then they had the spacing issue with mm -hmm. Krug. Yeah. And that was the game right there, the giveaway, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden Toronto scores. And, again, Buchnevich just has not played well, I would say, like, you know, 10 or 15 games right. now. It's been tough. Hey, uh, are you guys NASCAR fans? I became a NASCAR fan yesterday. Why is that? So at 2 in the afternoon or so, uh, 4 in the afternoon, actually, when the race is starting, our buddy Chris Muir from Golf Discount sends me a text, and he says, want to bet on Daytona? I'll take the odd numbers. You take the evens for 20 bucks." I said, I'm in. And I watched Does that mean, it hold on, that means who finishes? Uh, Even number, uh, odd number? What, what do we got? Number 24, William oh, Byron. okay. Won the I race. got you. So I, I get the 20 bucks. It, I was enraptured by the Daytona 500. <laughs> they had a massive wreck uh, with eight minutes or eight laps left. And, and so there was one point where like seven of the top eight racers were even numbered cars. And I was thinking, oh, man, I'm in awesome shape. And then they have this wreck. And Ross Chastain, number one, is in the lead. And I'm thinking, oh, no, he's going to win. <laughs> <laughs> I paid really close attention to the whole race. It was awesome. You have just proven why yeah. football has exploded yeah. because because you're yep. into gambling on NASCAR, yeah. so it kind of explains it the great. football explosion. But it does change your perspective, and I I advise it. Now that the NASCAR season is underway, if you want to be interested, maybe that's the way to go. Okay, I'm glad that you changed your tune a little bit, Dan. He was making fun of NASCAR a little bit at my expense. Shocking. At my expense. <laughs> I'm not a super NASCAR fanatic, but I do enjoy watching it every once in a while. I actually enjoy IndyCar a little bit more. Mm -hmm. F1 <laughs> is something that I find intriguing as well. But Randy just had a lot of fun of poking fun at me and NASCAR because my suggestion was maybe we should throw in some NASCAR questions into the fight. Some uh. WNBA, some NASCAR. <laughs> Uh, so here's my thing. I, 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 there's I, no way you would allow that. You'd be no, upset the rest no, of the yeah, show. I would say that we need to get a different fighter. But here's, <laughs> uh, but, but here's the thing, Dan, and you know this. In the South, oh, math gosh. is taught in a different way. And it's one, two, Earnhardt. <laughs> Cannot. You're right. offending every NASCAR racing fan no, that's out there. That yes, can't you count. are. You're offending everybody <laughs> and a Southerner. I apologize if you're a NASCAR fan who takes offense at this. All due respect. No offense intended at all, really. No, but you you meant it. If, if you're a Southerner who says Earnhardt rather than three, I think it's kind of funny. <laughs> <laughs> but now you're a NASCAR fan, and I'm, that's what's, that's in. what matters. Oh, Welcome. William Byron took over the number 24 car for uh, Jeff Gordon. Yesterday, the 40th anniversary to the day of the start of Hendrick Motorsports, which, of course, included Jimmy Johnson, uh, who is one of my favorite, and, and Jeff Gordon. You really did favorite. watch this. You did. Oh, doctor. You, you were, were all over it. <laughs> I was in. Yeah. Oh, now, now I like it. Okay, and then the big news of yesterday. Uh, 
Mizzou's Board of Curators just screws it up again. They get a good athletic director in Desiree Reed Francois, and then they put together a little oversight committee. And they say, well, we really don't trust the job that you're doing, even though she's doing an unbelievable job. The basketball program had fallen into complete disrepair. And she reluctantly, because she really likes Conzo Martin, fired him, brought in Dennis Gates last year before the conference season even started. This is a 22-23 season. The Mizzou basketball team, before the conference even season even started, experienced a 36% jump in attendance. Last year, for the first time in more than 40 years, the football program sold out five consecutive games. Desiree Reed Francois understands that there's a science to getting people into your facilities, especially now in 2024 when people have so many other things to do. And this is a major fox pass on the part of the faux pas for many, uh, on the part of uh, the, the Board of Curators at the University of Missouri. They're I don't know who did it, and I don't know why they did it, but when Desiree Reed Francois leaves your SEC program to go to a program with $177 million in debts, and she's getting paid less money to go there, you've got a problem that needs to be fixed. And the problem is, is that the people in charge are the problem. It's the board of curators that have caused this, and it's really for the uh, it's not in the big scheme of things a tragic thing but from a sports standpoint it is because she's the best they're going to get they aren't going to get any better than desiree reed francois and they screwed up and she deserves a lot of credit for everything that she does now for the person who will be taking over and coming in i'm very interested on how this will look is it really concerning to you guys that you now have this oversight committee that's just going to be looming doesn't that when you hear oversight committee doesn't that sound a little bit like micromanaging they're going to micromanage you possibly and who exactly would want to step into that position knowing that you're going to have this oversight committee looking over your shoulder nobody good this has been a tough stretch for missouri blake baker left he had kevin peoples leaving sam horn is having tommy john surgery by all accounts and this will be the fourth ad search in less than a decade and that's an issue at the highest levels. And to go a little bit step uh, step further here, so the move comes just weeks after Missouri's Board of Curator, Curators, again, voted to create the Missouri Intercollegiate Athletics Special Committee. It's a four-member panel to monitor uh, Mizzou sports. And I'm with you guys. It, it just is ugly. And, and, Randy, you talked about it. You know, why would she jump to a lesser situation? Now, she is an Arizona grad, mm -hmm. and that's something Law to consider. School. Yep. Law school there. But $177 million in debt with their athletic department. She got the Missouri Athletic Department on the right foot. And the other thing is she could be overseeing one of the best college football programs in the country. Mm -hmm. Right now it is with the, with the finish in the top ten. And by all accounts, they should be excellent next year and have a chance to do some damage. Who knows how far they could go? And she's walking away from that. She obviously had a hand in the $50 million private donation i mean th mm -hmm. there's a lot of check marks in the box of keeping her and being favorable towards the university and it just doesn't make a lot of sense by at the, all no it, it doesn't and by the way the university of arizona i told this story a little bit earlier when it came out back in november do you guys remember this but this is the same university that somehow lost 240 million dollars do you guys remember that oh, story yeah. right yeah it's it's, it's so it's not a great situation to exactly no. go into, but I, it goes back to the Board of Curators and that Oversight Committee. When you hear the Oversight Committee, what do you guys think that that means of what exactly that they will be doing? Well, clearly they don't trust the athletic director. And you've got, to me, that uh, that committee is always going to be looking over the athletic director's shoulder. You hire an uh, athletic director because you trust them and give them the autonomy to build a program. And Desiree wasn't the only one. She always talked about her team. She would never take, never does. I'm, I'm, I'm acting like she's dead. She never takes credit herself. She always talks about the, the group of people that she brought in to help build that program at Mizzou. And we've seen a lot of brain drain at the University of Missouri over the years, a lot. And those people are going to follow her to Arizona. Those people trust her. She's a leader. 
and she, she has followers, and they know exactly what happened in those athletic offices at the University of Missouri, and they're going to lose a lot of really good people because they lost the best one. Now, there'll be athletic directors out there or wanting to be athletic directors that'll take this job. So they're, they're going to have their choice. Mm-hmm. It, it may not be exactly what they want because if you're a current AD, do you want to be looking over your shoulder? with every single move that you're making? Probably not. And the other thing is, though, on the flip side, you will get these, you know, probably young people that are assistant ADs that say, I'm ready to make that jump Mm -hmm. and I'll deal with whatever I have to deal with to get there. So there'll be choices, but it doesn't make a lot of sense why you'd let her go or that she would jump, not let her go, but she would jump to a different situation. One of the names that I heard last night is Laird Veach at Memphis, who got his career started at Missouri under Mike Alden. He was in charge. I know Laird. Yeah, if you work for him, right? Yeah, Missouri Sports Properties. Uh, and Good has guy. moved up. He's been at big schools. He's at Memphis now as their athletic director, raising a ton of money. Their programs are in good shape. He, he's young. He's vibrant. So he is a name. And there are other names. Mark Allnett, who's still up at Buffalo, is uh, is another name. Uh, Ren Baker, who's been considered for the job in the past, is a name to, to keep in mind. Sarah Bumgarner, who's at Texas, is another name. But the, the one that kept popping up when I talked to people yesterday was Laird Veach. And by the way, he was not too happy with Missouri strong arming him and his football program into playing here at the Dome this past year. <laughs> Let me give you a crazy name out there. Okay. Okay. John Sunvold. I think that'd be really interesting. You, you want to rally the troops mm-hmm. with a situation that by all accounts is kind of ugly. I don't know if he would take it. I know that his name has been talked about in the past. He lives a very comfortable life. He plays a lot of golf. His business is doing great. Lives in Columbia. Mm-hmm. His son played for the golf team um, a few years ago. But I'll just throw that out there. That would be kind of an and I don't have any background. This is not info that I got. Um, but he would be an interesting guy just to have his name in the ring if he would want to do it. Yeah. I, am I too crazy with this? No, I, I don't think so. I just wonder how much that job has changed over the years so that you you really have to be a specialist. Can you imagine, though, the money he'd probably be able to raise mm-hmm. with his connections oh, right. and getting indoors? Yeah, all the, uh, all He'd the have a ton. He, yeah. he could bring it all back together. So, yeah, there are, there are people out there, and there are people here in St. Louis. That I, I know that our buddy Mike Owens, formerly of Anheuser-Busch, is a guy that's expressed interest in that job before. So that would be interesting as well. But it's a shame because I think they had the right person in Desiree Reed-Francois, and she's gone now. To, and congratulations to Arizona for getting her. Yeah, it's a huge addition for Arizona, a huge loss for Mizzou. And luckily, whoever does come in, because of everything that she's done over the past few years, they're going to have a really nice launching pad to work with, including that $62 million donation. they will be really yeah. interesting to see how that's debbied up. Yeah, pretty amazing. Okay, we're off and running here on 101 ESPN. Coming up, the Cardinals are all there in spring training. The entire team has arrived. If the Cardinals are going to have a leader, who do you think it'll be? That's next on 101 ESPN.
Hey, the city season starts tonight, and if you want to make your city season even better, then you need to get together with our friends at Together Credit Union and pick up a St. Louis City SC debit card. 10% off all food and beverage purchases at all St. Louis City home matches. Plus, you get 10% off St. Louis City SC retail items at City Goods and City Pavilion or inside the stadium. And you get priority access to purchase tickets. And this is really cool. You have an opportunity to get in fast to the stadium when you have that City SC debit card from Together Credit Union. And right now, there's some great things that you can do with your money to make it grow at Together Credit Union. CDs are a great way to grow your hard-earned money. Right now, they're offering a competitive nine-month certificate of deposit with an APY of 5.00%, required minimum balance of $1,000. Visit your nearest Together Credit Union branch or go online to togethercu.org for details and start growing your savings today. Stop by and become a member at Together Credit Union. Early withdrawal credit only supply and may reduce earnings on the account. Rate offers are accurate as of January 18th, respectively. Rates are subject to change without notice. Other rates and terms available. Membership eligibility required. Federally insured by the NCUA. I think it's going to lift weight off a lot of people's shoulders, and uh, not just me, but, you know, I'm very f thankful to have him back. I love Carp. He's a great teammate. He's a great person, so, and he's a, good, he's a great player. So, uh, no, I'm happy to have him back, and uh, I think it's going to, you know, us as a group is going to make us all better. A lot of talk about leadership among the Cardinals since the signing of Matt Carpenter. That's Nolan Arenado, courtesy of Bally Sports down in spring training, and the Cardinals had clearly, because they're talking about it a lot, a leadership issue in 2023. So if the Cardinals are going to have a leader, if they're going to have a guy that they look to as, as their beacon in 2024, who's that leader going to be? For me, it's easy. It's your guy, Sonny Gray. Sonny Gray, I think, is the the leader because of what he's already doing right now. Over winter warm-up, he stated over and over again that he's going to be a leader by not only example, but vocally as well. And so far, guys, he has lived up to his words with actions. And you've seen, I know it's very early on in spring training, but the way that he is really going about leading this group down there, you have the promotion of Key Keffer, too, which is something that came about with a conversation with John Mosellock of adding something else to the pitching staff at the big league level. And also he says he wants to be an open book to this team. Mm -hmm. So he brings a clear intensity and he brings something that I believe that they were missing last season. And I think that intensity is passion is something they really need. And a lot of players are going to gravitate towards. I think the only issue I have with that Brooke is that he pitches once every five days. And mm -hmm. when you're not an everyday player, it's tough to be the leader of the team. Now, I, do I think he's the leader of the pitching staff? Absolutely. But I would also put Lynn in there. I would put Gibson in there. It seems that Gray is more vocal than the others. Brendan Donovan would be in my list as far as maybe getting to Mason Wynn and Jordan Walker because he's more of their age. 
overall, I'd put it Matt Carpenter. That's why you brought him in. You're not bringing him in because he's exceptional right now in his career, what he's doing on the field. By example, I would say Arenado and Goldie. And you can be a leader without being vocal. Now, Goldschmidt behind the scenes is vocal. Mm-hmm. He's like Scott Rowland. No, no, people didn't realize Scott Rowland was a leader vocally behind the scenes. Now, you may not have seen it on the field, but he is. And I think when you watch a guy like Arenado prepare, that's leadership. So those would be some of the leaders. But I I think this is getting overblown, to be quite honest with you. If you win, no one's talking about this kind of stuff. Yeah, Just go out and win. And maybe that's why they didn't, though. Uh, I agree, 100%. And so you look at issues as to why... You didn't win, mm-hmm. and leadership comes to the forefront. First of all, Brooke, I don't disagree with you at all. Yeah, so he came home to 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 lead the group. But <laughs> here's my thing, guys. Okay. There's only one guy that walked into that clubhouse and can tell guys, this is how you win a World Series. Only one, and that's Wilson Contreras. You, know, you got your guy behind the plate. How, how long was Yachty the leader here? So he's in a leadership position every single day. He can definitely be the leader of the pitchers like Yachty was. He knows how to win. We've seen his competitiveness, his desire, his interaction with his teammates. If there's going to be one guy, I know this sounds bizarre based on what happened last year. I think it's Wilson Contreras. I don't think it's bizarre at all because I think when you look at this team, and you look at a guy that plays every single day in a demanding position in his second year, he should be a leader of the pitching staff, but also he can lead with his bat. Mm -hmm. And leadership comes from, in my opinion, performance on the field. Mm -hmm. And so if you have performance on the field in a positive way, you definitely can be a guy that leads vocally and by example. So I, I think both those things are true. I I agree with you. I think that Wilson Contreras, because of everything that happened last season, maybe a little bit of that flair and intensity was taken away from him a little bit. But I like going into the season. We played that audio last week where Ali Marmol mentioned that he wished he would have handled that situation better. Mm -hmm. It seems like they understand they need to uplift him and just let Wilson be Wilson. I think that that's a big key part of it where he can be that leader. I do think it is a good thing that you have multiple leaders in this situation. And when you brought up Nolan Arnato, Dan, we talked a lot about this yesterday because there was a lot of comments that came back and frustrations maybe that you could say where people will say well you know that's Nolan Arenado he should be a vocal leader and a leader by example but don't you think too that Nolan holds himself to a very very high standard and if he's not performing well then he believes that's what's holding the team back yeah and takes a back seat to his leadership but you know that goes into individual players making plays and being expected to be at a certain level and he's not so to your point brooke i think sometimes you can get into a shell and say i'm not performing at my level i need to focus on what i need to do to get to that level and how am i leading if i'm not putting up the numbers that people expect now with the contract comes a lot of responsibility i also Mm -hmm. think that that's part of it you know i mean you're making what 35 million dollars if you're struggling you still have to lead especially Mm -hmm. with the youth that's coming on this team I still put in Newpar in that category. I still put in, uh, obviously, Jordan Walker, Mason Wynn. And I'll give you another guy that I think can lead, too. And that's Tommy Edmond. Mm-hmm. Yes. Definitely. You know, he's a center fielder now, but he's been around for a little bit. And that would be somebody else that I think can get the ear of these younger players. Yeah, I, I would agree. So there's a lot of opportunities for people to assume leadership roles for this team. And clearly the the way the Cardinals have this set up with their clubhouse culture is that the players are going to assume those leadership roles. I was mentioning yesterday, Dan, that with Whitey here and with Joe or uh, Joe Torrey and with Tony, those guys were the overall overarching exactly. leaders, right? And this is going to be a, uh, there's a lot of ownership given to these players. Well, a lot of managers will say the clubhouse is the player's mm-hmm. office and I shouldn't be stepping in there. Now, if I call a player out of the clubhouse and bring him into my office for one-on-one meetings, which happens just about every day, matter of fact, it does happen every day, mm-hmm. but the players, that is their area to police You know what I mean? And that's so you expect certain guys to speak up when need be, or sometimes you don't say a word. You just Mm -hmm. give somebody and put your arm around them and a little pat on the butt and say, go get them. Absolutely. That's Dan. That's Brooke. I'm Randy. Coming up, City SC opens up their season tonight with a CONCACAF Cup matchup over at City Park. So City uh, City picked anywhere from fourth to tenth in their conference. 
not getting much respect, are they? That's next on 101 ESPN. Hey everyone, it's Brooke for Universal Windows Direct. Have you been surprised by your energy bill lately? Look, I know that I have. And then you just start scrambling and trying to find ways to cut down on costs. One way that you probably didn't even realize is through your windows. And that's why I got connected with my guys over at Universal Windows Direct where their windows keeps the cold air out. Call Universal Windows Direct today and they'll upgrade your new windows to triple pane glass for free. That's three layers of glass between you and the cold outside. Triple pane means this. This, extra protection from the elements, a consistent temperature, excuse me, in your home, increased energy efficiency, which leads to that reduced heating and cooling costs that we were talking about with that energy bill. So call this number today, 314-334-2522 to schedule your free in-home estimate. And you can get all of these benefits. For every two windows you buy, you get the next two for free, plus that free upgrade to triple pane glass, and they'll double your energy tax credit restrictions apply. Tell them I told you to call and get an additional $250 off your next project for the last windows you'll ever need. Go to UniversalWindowsDirect.com. Like me, you'll be saying, I love my windows.
This is Rocky with your Sports Center update, driven by Johnny Londoff Chevrolet and Johnny Londoff Autoplex. The Blues yesterday afternoon get beat up by the Toronto Maple Leafs. They'll be back in action hosting the Islanders on Thursday evening. It'll be a 7 p.m. puck drop. Catch the pregame show right here on your home for the St. Louis Blues, 101 ESPN, starting at 6 p.m. And tonight, St. Louis City kicks off Season 2. This time, though, it is in the CONCACAF Champions Cup Round 1, a matchup against the Houston Dynamo tonight. That's 7 p.m. down at City Park. That is your Sports Center update, driven by Johnny Londoff. Find your roads and shop 24-7 at Londoff.com and L- Londoff.com and LondoffAutoplex.com. Are you kidding me? As Matthew Rocchio mentioned, St. Louis City SC opens their 2024 season tonight. CONCACAF action over at City Park. They take on the Houston Dynamo. And, uh, of course, you can see that game, as you can see all games, on Apple. Last year, St. Louis City won the Western Conference in their first year of existence. They were great. This year, the experts over at MLSsoccer.com have made their predictions. And, oh, by the way, last year they had St. Louis City finishing <laughs> last in the Western Conference. This year, they have Seattle winning the West. They have LAFC finishing second. Sporting KC, or just Kansas City. Is that right? Yeah. Or Kansas. Sporting Kansas, right? Sporting Kansas. Yeah, there you go. They've got them third, FC Dallas fourth, and then City is picked fifth ahead of Houston. So, first of all, after the great first season for City SC, how do you feel about a fifth-place prediction for this year? Well, let let me just throw this out there. Maybe Matthew can help us out. CONCACAF, Matthew, if you can describe it for fans that are out there, and then they start the regular season with MLS. So it's a busy couple of weeks. Yeah, so they have CONCACAF. Essentially, it's you take the champions or the top teams from um, all the North American and uh, Mexican and some of the Caribbean leagues, and you put them into a te- uh, tournament that started with 27 teams. Five teams get automatic qualification to the uh, like the second or third round, but City starts in round one with the other 22 teams, and they are playing an MLS team instead of maybe having to travel to play a Mexican team or a Canadian team or what have you. So yeah, they, they start off with Houston. They have Houston. It's a two-leg um, competition, so you play Houston once this week and once next week, and then you get into the MLS schedule. Okay, so some of the analysts, here we go. 15 of the 17 have City making the playoffs. If you were in year two of an expansion team, I think you would take that in a heartbeat. <laughs> Six of the 17 with a home field playoff game. I, I think a few things to look at. Will Berkey have a regression? He was so good a year ago. Klaus, is he healthy? That's going to be something you watch. And how you just come out of uh, responding for the first two weeks. It is a busy first two weeks. It's a demanding sport, even though they don't play back-to-back on night after night after night. But a demanding sport. So those are some of the things I'm looking at as they kick it off tonight. I, that's what I'm looking forward to. I, I honestly like when City SC kind of comes in, I wouldn't say as an underdog or maybe not expected to do as well because it worked out well for him last season. And you even have, we had Samuel Dineron on and he talked about how it was bulletin board material. The fact that so many people nationally didn't think that they would be able to do what they accomplished in their first inaugural season. And I think the second follow-up is going to be even better for City SC because you have that experience with Roman Berkey. It was his first time in the MLS. So now he has a year of that, a season of that under his belt. You also have the addition of of Nicholas Dewar, and he's the left back that they had just signed recently from Denmark on a three-year contract. Now, I don't know if he's actually going to be playing tonight. I think it was kind of up in the air currently. Yeah, so they they talked about that um, yesterday, and pretty much until you play 75 minutes in a game, Carnell doesn't feel comfortable playing you 90. And mm-hmm. so he's played 30, 30. He just and 40. got here three yeah. weeks ago. And he's played 30, 30, and 45 in the three friendlies that he's played. And so he's not up yet to that 75, 90 minute mark. So if Duyer does play tonight, it will be probably off the bench in the 60th minute if he does play. And they got a lot of production last year, City did, out of Nicholas Giacchini. And he's gone. He's moved on to. Uh, Como. Como. In, yeah, over, well, he gets to overlook Lake Como. So uh, that, <laughs> it's one. good for him. Oh, darn it. But I'm he's, sure they uh, look exactly th- the that's, same. Right? That's a big loss. And as you mentioned, Brooke, they picked up Deer. They picked up, picked up Chris Durkin from D.C. United in the trade uh, that uh, 
that, that sent uh, Jared Stroud to D.C. And then Tomas Totland, uh, long linked with uh, the MLS. He's finally here. So their, their talent level should be enhanced a little bit. But one of the things that happened on the stretch is the opposition kind of caught up with their approach. And so Carnell, with different players, is going to have to have a little bit different approach this year than he had last year as well. Well, this, and I think a lot oh, of that... Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I, go ahead, Brooke. I think it also had to do a lot with injuries as well. And Zhao Klaus being fully healthy this season, or as healthy as possible, I think is going to be a big key part of that because when you're talking about that stretch towards the end, it took a while for him to get back from injury. I think it's going to be a nut house down there. I mean, oh, people yeah. go crazy yes. over this. It's like Christmas morning if you're a soccer fan here in St. Louis. And City SC President Diego Gigliani will be our guest at 915. So looking forward to asking him, if you know, what changes would you make to the game day experience down there? It's about as good as it gets. I don't know what you do differently outside of maybe getting past KC yes. in the first round. Right. Other, other than that, yeah, I think a good question to ask him because I've heard this from a lot of people. I'm sure you guys did as well because it was the first season was just getting into the game and ticket prices, which, of course, supply and demand. Everybody it was the hottest ticket in town. So, of course, mm -hmm. you want to go. But I wonder if they're going to make it a little bit more accessible this season for everybody. I think after winning, it probably will be less accessible. Yeah. After having the success they had, that they had last year and the lack of success that the Cardinals enjoyed, it seems like a lot of the money is being transferred for from the Cardinals this year to St. Louis City SC. He had such a core base of soccer fans here in St. Louis that it didn't matter who came here. If, if, if the games were going to be uh, played in the MLS, I mean, they would have supported anything. They, they just love soccer. But I do think that they have brought in um, the casual fan. I, I think the casual fan is saying, you know what, this is cool. Mm -hmm. I may not understand everything that's going on in the field, but if I go down there with my kids, have a great experience, I'm coming back. And I think that's what I've heard from a lot of people that are sports fans here in town. Yes, I love the Cardinals. Yes, I love the Blues. But I went to a city game and I was sold. Mm -hmm. And exactly. some of my, you know, discretionary income is going to go to city to go take in a couple of games. I don't know about you guys, but in my own neighborhood, I see a lot of City SC flags. I see City SC bumper stickers. And Dan, you were around and Randy too. But Dan, I remember seeing you at those Alderman meetings when Carolyn Kendall was advocating so hard for getting City SC here, an MLS team here, and building that stadium. I think the fans have matched the energy that this owner ownership group has brought and you're seeing it just play out in such a beautiful way that to me it was one of the most exciting environments that I've been around is going to those city SC games because it was just so exciting the energy the fans standing the entire time the intensity from the fans was just so fun to watch you knew that the Taylor family would not screw this up <laughs> no. I mean they they've done so much for St. Louis Soldiers Memorial the arch grounds I mean that barely touches the surface of what St. Louis means to them and what you know what the uh, the other thing is what st louis has gotten out of the taylor family in in such a charitable way they weren't going to screw this thing up and they've come in done everything it seems like from the outside looking in properly and if there have been issues it's been behind the scenes but in terms of the core group of soccer fans they got what they wanted and the casual fan is coming in got here in a hurry it's february 20th and the opener is tonight over at city park for st louis city sc against houston that's dan that's brooke i'm randy and coming up we've got take it or leave it get your text into the air comfort service text line three 314-399-9646-314-399. Yo-ho! Take your Yo-ho! Thank you, Dan. No there problem. Yo-ho! I gave you two. <laughs> the only next on 101 ESPN.
Hey everyone, it's Brooke here, and I want to tell you why I love the Missouri Athletic Club so much. I actually am going over to the West location today, and that's because they're helping me stick to my 2024 goals, and that is getting in shape, reaching new fitness goals, and also getting back into the sport that I love, grew up playing, and that is tennis. I'm reaching those new fitness goals with Christine. She is my personal trainer, and she is keeping me in line no matter how much Randy is trying to tempt me with all the treats that he brings in constantly all the time. I'm still able to reach my fitness goals and I'm also getting back into tennis with Scott I actually hit with him this past Friday on the court and he was running me all over the place so it was a great workout they always provide a wonderful experience over there and that's why I love my MAC That's my final offer. Take it or leave it. Time for Tioli here on 101 ESPN. Brooke, Dan, Matthew, and Randy. And we welcome your text. 314-399-9646. 314-399. ho Kids, Anthony Rendon of the Angels, who's played mm. exactly 200 of about 540 games since he signed with the Angels, yesterday arrived in camp and told writers... Baseball's never been a top priority for me. This is a job. I do this to make a living. When asked if baseball was a priority, he said, oh, it's a priority for sure because it's my job. I'm here, aren't I? Take it or leave it, Anthony Rendon is more typical of the Major League Baseball player than any of us know. He just says it. I think that there is also more context to that quote because he also mentioned that it's not going to be before his family and mm -hmm. his faith. And I think he was just saying in general that he prioritizes those two things and that this is just a job. So I, I think in, when you kind of hear the full context of it, I get what he's saying. I mean, you should be putting your family first. Of course, your job is what helps pay for things for your family. But at the same time, when you get the full context of the quote, I don't think it's that bad. I think most people would expect baseball players to actually enjoy baseball he says i do it to make a living I, i'm with you randy i think there's more players that are like that they just don't come out and publicly say yeah, it. they do it because they're good and can you imagine being his teammate when you hear that yeah. you say are you kidding me so we got this guy at third base who really doesn't care about being here is just cashing a check and then it's worse that he's been out so much yes over the course of a 245 million dollar contract 
He says my faith and family will become be first over the job. I don't. I don't think that that's that bad to say that. I think uh, that if you just if you just put it in that, and we're not hearing him vocalize it. So if you just put it in that context of saying. It's never been a top priority to me, but he's saying because my faith comes first in my family, I don't think it's necessarily a negative thing to say that. But he also said prior to this that he wanted the season cut shorter, and my response to that, no problem. You want the, yeah. the season cut shorter, then we'll just take a little bit of chunks out of your, out of your checks too. Two-way street. And here's the thing. Let's just do a comp that's close to us. We don't have any questions in this room that Adam Wainwright's top priorities are his faith and his family, right? Mm -hmm. But did he ever question his desire to love baseball? No. That, that's what I'm talking about. Is yeah. You, you, I, I expect, and it's, it's unreasonable, because a lot of athletes are only playing because they're good at it. J.D. Drew was that way. J.D. Drew picked up a bat when he was 14. He never liked baseball, but he was great at it. Mm -hmm. And he's another guy that was hurt all the time, played because he was good. And that's what, what Rendon is doing. But... He just, he vocalized it. I think so. And I think that there is definitely a lot to it. When you mentioned that, Dan, I had completely forgotten about that he had said that yeah. as well. So it does add a little bit more flair where, okay, you're saying it's not your top priority. And then on top of that, you had mentioned those prior comments of wanting to shorten the season. If you do want to shorten the season to spend more time with your family, there is nothing wrong with that. And your But faith. then it comes with a pay cut. Yeah. I, in the, uh, 314 says it's a given that your family and faith come before your job. Doesn't need to be said. I think that's legitimate, too. Mm -hmm. I, I just think if you're a teammate of his, you have to sit there and wonder with his previous comments and these comments, how much does this guy really want to be there to help us win? W let's make one more comp because that is supposed to be a given. It wasn't for Tom Brady. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just ask Giselle how that yeah, went over. exactly. So take it or leave it, guys. Uh, LeBron James says that he is 50-50 on if he will have an actual farewell tour or if he will just Tim Duncan it. Take it or leave it. There's no way that LeBron James will not have an actual farewell tour. Totally take that. Yeah, he's going to have a farewell he will. tour. He's he wants so much attention. He gets attention. Mm -hmm. He floats out there with his agents that he could be traded. Of course he wants the attention. I think that maybe he just kind of wants to build up some anticipation where it's like, no, 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 you do need to do your farewell tour. Doesn't I, it feel like that? I, I don't think it's a bad thing for the NBA, though, either. No. To have a farewell tour for some of your great players i think it's good I th you get a lot of exposure out of it it's kind of fun gifts that you give the guy um here's the question i have when will the fairway farewell tour take place he's what 38 39 and playing at such a high level he has mentioned on the record he wants to play with his son i don't think his son's an nba player at least not yet but uh i would anticipate that he stays and gets and just squeezes the most that he can out of this thing i think they both play with the lakers next year you think Bronny does? Mm -hmm. I think they draft him. He might not play much, but he'll be the twelfth guy, and I, that's how he he LeBron ends his career on the same team with his son in L.A. He is amazing. That he wants that. Yeah. All right, take it or leave it. This is why we love sports. Got of the zone to slip ahead. Julian got it up. Mahar. Mahar looking to center it. Did he score? Did you Okay, this is why we love sports. That's Gary Thorne, historic voice in the NHL, with the call of his grandson's goal from a high school game, a streaming game of all things between Connecticut's Kent School and Canterbury School. Oh, that's How a, awesome is that? That's fantastic. I love it. I love Gary Thorne. I thought he was one of the best that's ever done it. But to do your grandson's goal on the air like that, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I'm going to take it. That is such a cool. When I saw that, that's such a special moment to be able to do that. And what a great call it was, of course, for him. But I'm saying in that moment, you could just feel the energy and excitement that he has specifically for him. I mean, calling your grandson's goal? That's so that's special. Amazing. Yeah. On a mm -hmm. streaming game of all things. Yeah. This guy's called the NHL <laughs> Stanley Cup Finals. Right, yeah. He's one of the historic voices. I miss him on the NHL. NHL. I do too. Yeah. He, was, he and Bill Clement to me were the National Hockey League when mm -hmm. I was growing up. I just, I loved listening to him. I've met Gary Thorne a number of times. He's a, a really good guy and loves the sport of hockey. So fun to listen to him. All right, Matthew, what do you got on the text line? Take it or leave it. You're having second thoughts on the Blues making the playoffs. Uh, I'm going to leave it. They're right where I expected them to be, right in the hunt. Right there? Yep. Well, I mean, they've had their down moments this year. They're they up have. moments. Yes. So do you think they're in or out? 
I think they're there on the last day of the season. It goes down to the last day mm-hmm. of the season. Yeah. I like that. Did you guys see the game last night? Minnesota, or I guess it was yesterday afternoon, Minnesota over Vancouver, 10-7. And it shows you how wild these final spots, not a pun intended here, but that's how wild it's going to be now going down the stretch with some of these teams. Yeah. Three hat tricks in the game, and Minnesota scores six goals in a five-minute and 45-second span. It was awesome. It was so great. take it or leave it. It's like baseball. Do you want a high-scoring game like that, or do you want a 1-1 game that comes down to a shootout? I, I want it to come down to a shootout. Me too. I do. I think that stuff is exciting. I like the 10-7 game. Really? Just wild, up and down, no defense. It's like <laughs> watching the Edmonton Oilers back in the day. Or like the watching NBA the NBA, NBA All-Star yeah, game. Yeah, All-Star I was going to say that. <laughs> Take it or leave it. A.J. McCarron should be the odds-end favorite for UFL Offensive MVP. Take it. Kaka. I'm going to take that. We're all in. I'm yeah. going to take it because I don't know anybody else, so I'll just go A.J. <laughs> McCarron. Yeah. Well, uh, Coach Becht thinks that they have four of the top five or six receivers in the whole league. So AJ's going to have some weapons to throw to. It's going to be great. And you know Becht is going to build an offensive line. So it's going to be great. Taylor Lee or Tyler O'Neill is out with a bad back before April 1st. I'm going to leave that. I bet Tyler O'Neill plays 140 games. He's a free agent to me. He's represented by Scott Boris. And he's going to wind up playing playing through injury. And he's going to get a payday of some sort because it's his final year before his contract expires. Okay, follow-up question for you. If he does do that, do you get more upset? I'm just saying that, of course, you wish a player success. But do you get more upset with him because you wish you could have done that? Or do you look at the Cardinals and say, why couldn't you get that out of him? Oh, I think it's totally on him. I agree with I, you. I think he just said, I'm not going to play through injury. I've got too much on the line, and I want to make the most money I can. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's uh, the M.O. of Boris clients. He's got, I mean, think about Boris clients right now. He's got a lot of guys that are sitting out. Juan Soto, by the way, who is represented by Scott Boris, said he is not going to talk about a contract extension with the Yankees until after the season. So another example of that. Makes sense. Take it or leave it. When the Blues play better competition, it's like when the Pirates play the Dodgers. The talent gap is noticeable. Uh, I'm going to take that. I think the Pirates actually did well against the Dodgers last year, if I'm not mistaken. They did. I think they took two or three or three or four in that first initial series that they had with the Dodgers. Yeah. So uh, I think I'm going to have to leave it. Schedule and results. I feel like we have seen the Blues at times play up to their competition. It's just sometimes on a consistent basis. But when you're talking specifically about the Maple Leafs, and we discussed this earlier, yeah, you could see a gap in the talent there. Well, the depth of talent. Yeah, Would there's no doubt about that, right? Yes. It's, just, uh, it's, it's unfortunate. But if you, if you ask most NHL observers, they would say, yeah, that the, the talent gap between the Blues and the top teams is pretty substantial. Take it or leave it. Wilking Rodriguez wins NL reliever of the year. Take it. Yep. yep. I'm going to go ahead and leave that. Roll age relief, man. It's a guy. I'll just take it just for funsies. <laughs> funsies? Funsies, yes. I like it. <laughs> Do you have one more take it or leave it? Yeah, let's get one more if we have it. Take it or leave it. Jordan Montgomery takes a shorter than four-year deal in free agency. I'm going to take that, guys, because I think that uh, – Teams are, are not going to give in. Now Now that spring training has started, the first year might be a wash. It happens when guys show up late. So you don't know what you're going to get out of Jordan Montgomery. So I would say a three-year deal would probably be something that, along the lines of what teams are going to be offering. If you hear that he signs a three-year deal, do you wish that the Cardinals would have gone out and gotten him? Depends on the money. Yeah. How much money it would cost. I'm going to leave it because I think there will be teams that deal with injuries, maybe big market teams, mm-hmm. and out of desperation – like Boris is saying, I'm sure to his clients, there's going to be injuries, there's going to be desperation, and we're going to wind up getting you the deal that you want. And apparently there are three teams interested in Blake Snell. Yankees, who were the, the, there were three oh, yesterday. Oh, Giants, and then there was one Angels. more. Yes. So uh, according to Boris, he's got people that are competing. I don't know if teams believe Boris as much as they used to, though. One more. All right. Uh, I can like this one. Take it or leave it. The amount of money NBA players make now, there's no legitimate way to fix All-Star Weekend. Take it. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that. Yeah. Take it for sure. I mean, yeah. if you offer these guys, let's say, just a million bucks, I mean, a lot, I say just, a million bucks to play in the All-Star game with an incentive to win it for another million bucks, What? What? I mean, LeBron's making $51 million. Think he cares? Mm-hmm. He's, he's, he's a billion-dollar player. He doesn't care about that. Although it seems like he enjoyed that in-season tournament. But, right, <laughs> he, he, did, he yeah. talked about the $500,000, yeah. how that was a, a big deal to him. But 
I think with this, it, it is. It's an exhibition, and it's not going to be. It's a shooting contest. It's a different sort of basketball game, but it's a shooting contest. I loved Adam Silver when he handed over the uh, trophies. Like, okay, the winners. Well, he said, "Well, here you go." You scored the most <laughs> he <said> points. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, and they do get some sort of prize, cash prize, right? Yeah, they do. Maybe it just goes to your charity. Do you make it a little bit bigger? But then, as you mentioned, they already are making so much money. Is that even a good enough incentive? Yeah. I'm, it's it's one day. The, I, I don't have great expectations of All Star Games now, anyway. So, I think it is what it is. I'll, I'll just deal with it and you know move on to the next day. That's take it or leave it on, on 101 ESPN coming up with Desiree Reed Francois leaving Mizzou. What's that say about Mizzou's athletic department? And does it say anything about Arizona's? That's next on 101 ESPN. Hey, if you're going to be in the market for a new vehicle, I want you to go to AutoLoanPro.com first and download their Game Plan Playbook. That'll get you through the entire process. It'll describe the process of what Auto Loan Pro does, and what they do is provide you the best deal for your auto loan. I'll say it again, the best deal for your auto loan. Best payments, best interest rate. When you go to AutoLoanPro.com, they've been at it. They're dealing with over 50 different lenders to help you get the very best financing on your next vehicle. And even if you've had a hiccup with your financing, they're going to help you out. As a matter of fact, if you can make a payment, you're going to get the loan. And when you go to AutoLoanPro.com, if you don't know exactly what you're looking for, they can provide you with an array of different used vehicles or cars and trucks priced under $10,000. Plus, they'll give you the value for your trade-in at AutoLoan Pro. They really do great work. It's a great St. Louis company. And if you're financing a car, there's only one thing to know. Choose AutoLoan Pro at AutoLoanPro.com, and they're going to work hard to make sure that you get the best rate possible at autoloanpro.com.
today's top stories. It's the opening drive's fresh take. I'll continue to say this. Um, she she has been very supportive to us, and during our road trip, uh, she was present at Ole Miss. So. I look at ADs who are supportive, ADs who's not. We have one and had one that was very supportive, uh, and she was on just on the trip. So uh, that's how I look at it. I don't, you know, look at the tomorrows and the yesterdays. Here we are today, and we have a situation where we have an AD opening. That's Mizzou basketball coach Dennis Gates on the departure of Desiree Reed Francois as athletic director th- to the University of Arizona. It's 807 Time Check brought to you by Clarkson Jewelers, an officially licensed Rolex jeweler. Brooke, Dan, Randy, and as a coach, I'm sure that all of those guys, Dennis Gates and all, all the people that are coaching at the University of Missouri, Dennis Gates and Eli Drinkwitz, chief among them because they're in the revenue sports, they appreciate the fact that the athletic director has their back at all times, attends every game, home and road, always is supportive of them. And then you have the Mizzou Board of Curators that apparently doesn't have the back of the athletic director. And if you hadn't seen earlier this month, the... Uh, board of Curators at the University of Missouri announced a new oversight committee aimed at focusing on athletics, one that called for accountability from the athletic department to the Board of Curators. Well, for me, when you hire an athletic director, you hire them to direct athletics and you give them autonomy and in any walk of life. If you're a leader, you hire good people and let them do their job. And clearly that was not happening at Missouri with the board of curators and the athletic Depar- d- uh, director role. With the oversight committee, my first reaction is, is that it sounds like micromanaging because that makes it seem like they're looking over your shoulder. And it also makes it seem like you might be doing something wrong, which if you're an athletic director who has even her few years here we talked about the long list of things that she has done to really build up this athletic program and of course the success of Eli Drinkwitz who she didn't hire but still the success that they have seen with the game experience with football and the things that she's done for the athletics program and then you have that 62 million dollar donation coming in it seems like they want to maybe oversee how that money is spent and this is just my personal perspective and what I'm guessing from this because I have to guess because there's so much secrecy around this. I I found it interesting, Ben Fredrickson's article today in the Post-Dispatch. He said a Missouri Athletics director and the UM System Board of Curators were trending in opposite directions. So this has been going on for a while. said it's a story as familiar as black and gold to Mizzou. And now Desiree Reed Francois is the new AD at Arizona largely because of it. And this is the part I loved. A Mizzou ecosystem that by design allows for more cooks in the kitchen. Man, if there's anything that's been a truer statement, and I love the article by Ben, it was terrific, it's that. I I also felt, you know, like she was at the forefront of NIL. She was helping out her coaches navigate NIL. And to your point, Brooke, they were bringing in money. They were bringing in a substantial amount of money. And it just doesn't make a lot of sense because uh, you've got a, you know, she's going to make a what would be, for me, a lateral move or a lesser move. $177 million that she's got to get out of debt with Arizona and going to a team that's out of the SEC. That just doesn't make a lot of sense. And she's leaving for less money than she was getting paid at Missouri. That's pretty telling as well that she jumped, as far as I can tell, this is the first athletic director job that opened since the that board was put together that four-person board that oversees the athletic director at mizzou it appears to have become an untenable situation for desiree reed francois and desiree reed francois is a, a pretty amenable person if missouri's board of curators is screwing this up then maybe they need to change the board of curators because from an athletic, to, that's the front porch to your university, right? If, mm-hmm. if you have problems with athletics and you don't trust your athlete, if you're showing a distrust of your employees, 
then maybe you need to get other people in charge. So you have the board of curators to deal with, which is something that is very normal in college sports, but now you have this oversight committee. That does sound a lot for an athletic director who is coming in. Now, I know that there will be plenty of people who will be willing to take this job because of everything that Mizzou has going on. There's so much excitement around Mizzou, especially with this whole 12-team playoff format that we're going to see in college football. Mizzou, with their schedule, is going to be an obvious favorite to make it into that new playoff format. And then you have Eli Drinkwitz, who signed that extension through 2028 here recently. There's a lot of excitement around this program right now, so I'm sure a lot of people will jump at the chance. I'm just worried about the this oversight committee and what exactly they will be doing and how much that might hamper building around the success even more and just letting an athletic director be an athletic director. I, I'm going to throw some names out there and, and this is just me off the top of my head, but Doug Gillen, deputy, uh, deputy AD at Mizzou. He was at the beginning of the SEC era. He hired drink. Uh, Sarah Baumgartner, who is currently the executive senior associate AD at Texas. She was a lead fr uh, fundraiser at Mizzou for many years. Mark Olnut played at Mizzou um, and has risen above a lot of levels that I think people thought. He is currently the AD at Buffalo. Laird Veach, who we talked about before, Mizzou ties from his days at Learfield and Mizzou Sports Properties. Um, I, I also threw out the name of John Sunvold as a crazy name potentially out there. Now, there are reports that he has said, I'm not interested, but that can change with just one meeting or what they expect. Um, what would you do for an interim AD? Would you think like Gary Pinkle? You know, somebody that just to bridge the gap until that next person. Again, I'm just throwing names out there, but it will be a desirable job. It's just a matter of. If that person says, I'm not dealing with the board of curators, I don't want somebody looking over mm -hmm. my shoulder with every move I make. I think that's an issue that they're going to have to come to grips with. If you're going to have quality people in place, and by the way, uh, a former Mizzou uh, assistant to Mike Alden, Ross Bjork, just got maybe the best athletic director's job in the country at Ohio State. He had been at Texas A&M. But there's a lot of former Mizzou people out there. But right now, with the way things are set up, they all know how good Desiree Reed Francois is. I, I got a text from another uh, Division One athletic director who said, uh, hold on, let me get to this. Uh, Can't believe Mizzou let Desiree get away. Couldn't agree with you more. I have followed her since she was at Wake Forest. She's the real deal. This is the way other athletic directors are feeling about Desiree Reed Francois. So if she's being treated that way at Mizzou, why would you give Mizzou the opportunity to hire you if you're good? Yeah, I, I'm very interested to see how they will handle this because another question for you guys, how do you think that Eli Drink was, I know he put out a nice little statement wishing her the best and thanked her for everything that she's done with the program, but is this not the third athletic director that he's worked with during his tenure there at Missouri? At Missouri you me? just hit the nail on the head, Brooke. I wonder if they're behind the scenes or issues with Drinkwitz and... Desiree Reed Fr Francois mm. and the board of curators comes in and says drink is our guy you know we've paid him a lot of money and he's taken this to a different level and if you have issues with her that's it we're, we're gonna side with the head coach well I don't, again, that's just me yeah. speculating I don't know yeah. I don't know if things have gotten better since she first arrived at Missouri. But her first fall at Mizzou, I was told by somebody very close to the program, in the program, as a matter of fact, when I asked, hey, how's uh, Drink getting along with Desiree? I was told Desiree said, this is, she's, he's not my coach, he's the board of curators coach. Not that she disliked so him, but yeah. that was, she, she didn't hire him. And so, and the board of curators, by the way, had told Jim Sterk, go find another list for us, right? When he brought in the, the Anderson guy from uh, Arkansas State, two other, uh, I think the Air Force guy. And the board of curators said, can you go get us another list? And he yep. did, and he wound up with Drink. So, yeah, that, that's a very strong possibility that Drinkwitz won a power battle. That's not out of the realm of possibility. It happens all the time. It really does. Where the coach is having success, and if doesn't feel like the AD is fully behind them, mm -hmm. who's going to win? The right. coach is having success. Yeah. Yep. Especially the football coach. That's Dan. That's Brooke. I'm Randy. Coming up here on 101 ESPN, we've got John Kelly, the TV voice of the Blues, talking about yesterday's game. And let's go happy. Sunshine lollipops. Let's talk about playing the Islanders tomorrow here on 101 ESPN. <laughs>
Hey guys, you can be the best for your family and yourself and have more energy and a better attitude. Yes, you can. All you need to do is go to lowtusa.com and learn about Mentality. Mentality has two great locations in St. Louis. They're in Chesterfield and in South County. And what they do is they restore guys' testosterone levels. Your testosterone level drops as you go through life. And what you want to do is make sure that your testosterone level is in that range of normal that it was in in your 20s. And that's what Mentality does. They're going to do a complete panel on your blood work and their doctors are going to find out where your testosterone level is and then they have an FDA approved testosterone treatment and you go in every week and you get that treatment and your testosterone level does become restored and that low energy and motivation goes away. If you're fatigued and tired all the time, you feel so much better. If you have de decreased mental acuity, you're not as sharp as you used to be, you will be when you go to Mentality, and they're going to work with your insurance company to provide the lowest out-of-pocket expenses possible. Get to Mentality. Get started today at LowTUSA.com. Talking everything St. Louis Blues as we head into the Blues Booth. Presented by Boardwalk Hardwood Floors, a proud partner of your St. Louis Blues. Find your perfect new floor at our four convenient locations and online at BoardwalkHardwood.com. Another tough one for the Blues yesterday over at Enterprise Center as they fall 4-2 to the Toronto Maple Leafs. Blues did make it interesting late, and then an empty net goal put it away for the Maple Leafs. Joining us now is the TV voice of the Blues, John Kelly, who joins us every Tuesday morning here on 101 ESPN. J.K., good morning. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you, Randy? Everything's good. It was just one of those, and granted, the Blues did have a chance at the end, but when the top three stars are Matthews, Marner, Nylander, that's a lot of talent that's playing pretty well for Toronto. Yeah, their top players are really good. And I think, you know, the bottom line, a couple of things to me, the difference in the game was obviously the shorthanded goal. Um, aside from that, it was a fairly even game. But, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a tight game and you're down by one and you have a power play, a chance to tie the game and you give up a shorthanded goal. That's a real kick in the gut. I think the other thing is, and it really goes back as well to the loss in Toronto um, last week, um, the Leafs without Morgan Riley, their top defenseman, and the Blues score one goal in Toronto, and then last night or yesterday they score zero goals, five on five. So they don't take advantage of Toronto with a depleted defense, and even with Riley, they don't have the, the best defense in the NHL. So they don't score a five on five goal yesterday uh, against, to me, which is a very average defense. And I think that's the other difference in the game is that you've got to score five on five goals and the Blues couldn't capitalize with Riley's absence. Well, J.K., also just kind of looking at some of these overall games here recently, what are you seeing as the difference between these last four games in contrast to the previous eight where they were playing consistently pretty well? Well, you know, Brooke, they had won eight of ten, so that's a really good run. And now they've lost two in a row. So, I mean, obviously they were due for um, – some kind of 
pull back, right? They just can't keep winning eight of 10 every 10, you know, game segment. So, you know, obviously I think that the biggest thing to me is they're, they're not generating a lot of attack five on five, especially off the four check. And that's hard to do game in and game out. And, you know, Drew Bannister said that was one of his, his goals when he took over was that, you know, the blues have been become a really good rush team, but it's, it's hard to maintain that every night. And, and they want to score more goals off the four check. So I don't think in the last couple of games, they've generated as much um, offense off the four check, not a lot of extended zone time. So that's what I see the difference in the Nashville loss and the loss yesterday is not getting enough chances off the four check. That to me is the difference. John, kind of pull back the curtain a little bit. What's it like being around Drew Bannister from the ups and the downs of a season taking over for Chief, which was not easy because it was, a, I think, generally speaking, an unpopular move because the fan base loved the fact that Chief uh, brought in a Stanley Cup. But what, what's it like being around Drew Bannister every single day? You know, I think Drew Bannister is similar to, to Chief in that he, he, he just is very honest. And I like that he's very consistent in his message. Uh, Dan, well, they're obviously two different people. You know, Ruby has a big personality and, you know, he's an intimidating guy, you know, based on just the size of the guy and the fact that he had over 3,000 penalty minutes. Um, but but they're very honest people. And I, I like that Drew is consistent in his message, as I said, um, in terms of getting better habits and, and doing things that lead to victories. And, you know, you know when the Blues don't play well, he, he, he says that exact thing. And and so I, I think that he's done a really good job. And obviously the biggest upgrade from Baruby to Bannister in terms of numbers is the power play. I mean, the, the, the power play is, is three times as good a, as it was under Baruby this year. You know, not that it was all Craig Baruby's fault. Obviously, there are other coaches and obviously the players have to execute. But, you know, that's been the biggest difference is, is the power play. And I think they have been, generally speaking, a more consistent team. And obviously, he's got a pretty good record, so I think he's done a very good job. John, the Blues will be off until Thursday when they welcome the Islanders to town. The Islanders are at Pittsburgh tonight. It seems like ordinarily, coaching moves work in the National Hockey League, at least for a time. But the Islanders were over 500 before they hired Patrick Waugh, and they're 3-3-3 three, three, and three since they, they made him their head coach. And we don't know what direction it's going to go. But maybe that team is kind of like the Blues. Maybe they're, they're just not as talented as the teams that they're playing against on a regular basis. Well, you know, when I watched them play, Randy, and I saw them play the outdoor game on the weekend against the Rangers, um, two things really stand out to me. You know, aside from Barzell, they don't have a ton of natural skill and speed and, and stuff like that up front. The other thing with them is they have given up way too many leads in the third period, like they did on Sunday when they led 5-3 to three and lost in overtime to the Rangers. Um, and the penalty killing is not very good. So, but getting back to your point, yeah, normally teams, when they make a coaching change, they get a, they get a big boost, at least a short term boost. And it hasn't really happened under Patrick Waugh. Um, and it didn't really initially happen under Jacques Martin in Ottawa. Uh, but the senators have played much better in the last couple of weeks. They won in Tampa Bay last night, a, a very impressive win. Uh, but you're right. Normally, uh, you know, when you make a change like that, there, there is a big boost, but it's only been, I guess you'd say, just an average boost for the Islanders. So the eight games before the trade deadline for the Blues, I love the trade deadline. I think it's great for the, the fans across the league in hockey. I'm not going to ask you specifically about the Blues because, John, I know you, you follow the NHL very closely, all teams. How crazy do you think this trade deadline could get across the board? Well, Dan, I think that, generally speaking, a lot of teams think they're in the mix this year. And I don't think there's a powerhouse team out there that, you know, you know, scares other teams off. I mean, look what happened last year with Boston. They set an NHL record for most wins and points, and they get upset in the first round. Um, that just goes to show you the parity. So I, I do think there are, off the top of my head, I think there are seven, eight, maybe ten teams that think they could win. So... Um, you know, look what Vegas did last year. You know, they got Barbershop from the Blues, and he ended up on their top line with Jack Eichel and Marcia So and played really well. So, you know, sometimes moves like that, you know, do work out. But obviously every year, Dan, as we know, uh, the contenders make moves and only one team wins. <laughs> we know that. So 
you have to be careful what you give up in terms of future assets and draft picks and things like that. But I, to answer your question, I think it will be a, a an active deadline just because there are so many teams in the mix this year that think they can win. John, do you like a 10-7 game or do you like a 1-1 game that goes to a shootout? <laughs> Oh, 10-7 by far. Yes, me too. I, I love calling goals, Dan. That's that's you know, <laughs> that's, that's what I do. That's what I love to do the most is call goals. Hopefully, more Blues goals and opposition goals. Though, absolutely, right? absolutely. How about I, Minnesota yesterday, though? What's that? How about Minnesota? For six goals in five forty-five. Yeah, I know. I, you know, I wasn't fo- I wasn't watching the game. I was following the game. It was it was unbelievable. And Vancouver as a team, you know, speaking of cup contenders, you know, they're right there and they're a really good team. And for them to give up 10 goals and I think it was seven in the third period. Is that right? I think it was five, three after two. That's correct. They gave up five goals in the third or yeah, seven goals in the third period. That's amazing against the Vancouver Canucks. Yeah. Shocking. What a game. Uh, J.K., as always, thank you very much. We appreciate it. We'll be tuned in on Thursday night for the Blues and the Islanders. Okay, thanks for having me. Take care. That's John Kelly, TV voice of the Blues here on 101 ESPN. By the way, it is amazing when you look at Vancouver because we we, we tend to be laser-focused on what's going on with the Blues. But Vancouver in the Western Conference is absolutely dominant. They have 80 points, even after the loss yesterday. Uh, they're four points ahead of Dallas and then eight points ahead of Colorado. And in their division, the the next team is Vegas with 70. They're 10 points clear of the second-place team in their division. I think it's going to be fun with the Western Conference. So many teams have a chance to get in, including the Blues. Mm-hmm. Now, they're inconsistent. We've seen that from day one and the drop of the puck. But... I think it's going to be fun. I I love to see this stretch of games happening with the Blues and, again, eight before the trade deadline. And I think the difference, too, with the Blues is that J.K. was mentioning their power play improving. I think that that's a big highlight for them. It's improved overall with Drew Bannister. And then goaltending is still a big highlight for the Blues as well. Those could be the key difference makers for the playoffs. Big one on Thursday night against the Islanders. That's Brooke, that's Dan, I'm Randy, and Matthew is here. Coming up, Tim has a chance to make the Hall of Fame. When's the last time we had a Hall of Famer, Matthew? Yeah. Uh, last uh, late January. Okay. Yeah, January 2023. But a year clear of the last Hall of Famer. So Tim has a chance wow. today. You're on 101 Over ESPN. A year? Yeah. That's, wow. That's next on 101 ESPN. Hey, you want a great lunch today? I want you to head on over to the Fenton Barn Grill and enjoy their beautiful open-faced turkey sandwich. The turkey is so tender and juicy. And then it's got lettuce, tomatoes on Texas toast. It is mm, 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 sensational over at the Fenton Barn Grill. And on a day like today, take advantage of the greatest patio in town. Head to the Fenton Barn Grill. All you need to do is go to the soccer park and then follow Rudder Road to the Fenton Barn Grill. And you're going to have a great place to eat. You're going to have all kinds of sports on the TV screens. You're going to have fantastic food and you're going to have if you want the greatest trashed wings that you'll ever have they're so tasty they're so delicious order the trashed wings with some of that signature golden sauce at the fenton barn grill Mm -mm -mm. you'll absolutely love it and you'll love the people too say hi to kelly the the feisty redhead say hi to megan say hi to colleen the whole gang is so much fun and you'll really enjoy the fenton barn grill whether it's lunch today maybe a happy hour this afternoon dinner tonight or any time especially with the great weather coming up in st louis head on over to the fenton barn grill Grill, and when you do, tell them Randy sent you.
This is Rocky with your Sports Center update brought to you by Saliga Heating and Cooling. The Blues yesterday afternoon fall to the Toronto Maple Leafs 4 to 2. They'll be back in action hosting the Islanders on Thursday evening. That'll be a 7 p.m. puck drop. You can catch the game right here on 101 ESPN. Pre-game show starts at 6 p.m. in action tonight. St. Louis City SC tips off their or kicks off, I should say, their second season in existence, not with the MLS play this time it's CONCACAF Champions Cup tonight against the Houston Dynamo down at City Park that kicks off with a 7 p.m. time and Missouri Athletic Director Desiree Reed Francois is no longer the Missouri Athletic Director as she accepts the same post at Arizona. That is your Sports Center update brought to you by Saliga Heating Cooling, an independent American standard heating and air conditioning dealer. Brooke, Dan, and Randy here, and it is time for the fight, and we have a heavyweight showdown. This is for the Hall of Fame. Tim, Tim, welcome back. How are you doing? Doing good today, guys. How about yourself? Oh, I'm doing great. Look, I am, like, excited and nervous for you because it's been nearly a year since a fighter has made it all this way past Randy into the Hall of Fame. Do you think that you'll be able to get it done today? Uh, we'll, we'll see what the questions are right now. <laughs> <laughs> How Dang. many family and friends do you have listening for this chance at a historic day on the opening drive and a historic moment that could take place? Um, I'm probably not too many. I didn't really tell anybody too much about it. So uh, I told one, one group of friends, but I'm not sure if they're listening. So, uh, But I guess a few people know that I'm... Uh, I'm on the air for today. Well, Brooke, of course they're listening. We know that. So let's get into it. History could be made. All right. I feel like I'm more nervous than Tim is. Tim is not a guy that is shaken. He's like Jordan Bennington over here. Do Do I I look look nervous? nervous? (laughs) There you go. All right, Tim. We'll we'll stop messing around. Here's question number one. Happy birthday to Chuck. The round mound of the rebound, Charles Barkley. Which team did Charles win his lone MVP award with? Was it the 76? I guess that's your final answer. That's the final answer, 93. Okay. In 2006, uh, in the 2006 World Series, which Tiger was responsible for three of their eight errors across the series? Was it Brandon Inge, Joel Zumaya? Zumaya. Or or Justin Verlander. Okay, we'll go with uh, (laughs) Zumaya. All right. Question three, please. (laughs) Which Major League Baseball stadium is the oldest opening in 1912? Is it Dodger Stadium, Fenway Park, or Wrigley Field? Uh, Let's go with Wrigley. All right. And question four, who owns the Blues' single-season record for shutouts by a goalie with nine? Yaroslav Halak, Glenn Hall, or Brian Elliott? I believe it's Brian Elliott. All right. Boy, we we're supposed to stretch this segment until about 845. I'm not sure we'd be able to do that. But all right, Tim, you're pretty confident. How do you feel? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure on one of them and if he on another. So we'll see. Okay. All right. And here comes Randy. It is a Diet Dr. Pepper day for Randy. This is very serious. It is. Serious business. It is. Say hi to Tim again. Tim again. Good morning. How are you doing? <laughs> good, Randy. How about yourself? Good. Good luck today. Hope uh, that you have a lot of success. Hall of oh, Fame you, you showdown. Too. Thank you. Do you really mean that? Do you hope he had a lot of success? No. <laughs> <laughs> At least you're honest. Yeah. So I, I don't know anybody that likes to lose. I can't sit here and complain about Josh Hader not being competitive and then saying I don't compare about care about competing. Right? Okay. <laughs> well done. There you go. He did get $95 million. I don't know what you get if you win, though. <laughs> I'm just saying, yeah, not that. Okay. <laughs> All right, you ready to face Tim for a Hall of Fame showdown, Randy? Let's do it. Question number one. Happy birthday to Chuck, the round mound of the rebound, Charles Barkley. Which team did Charles win his lone MVP award with? Uh, I believe it was the 1993 Phoenix Suns. Is that your final answer, Randy? Yes, sir. Question two. In the 2006 World Series, which Tiger was responsible for three of their eight errors across the series? They uh, struggled. I'm going to go with uh, Curtis Granderson, though, in center field. The Grandy Man. Which Major League Baseball stadium is the oldest opening in 1912? Uh, I believe that 
Fenway opened before Wrigley. But I'm not positive about this, but I'm going to go that Fenway opened before. I'll go with Fenway Park. Fenway Park. Okay. Who owns the Blues single season record for shutouts by a goalie with nine? Moose. Brian Elliott, I believe, does. All right. Is it a historic day? I guess we're about to find out. Well, that's the question here. Tim, breezing through the first two rounds with tiebreaker wins. And even answered the couple questions in this one a little bit before we got through all three question or all three options so maybe he's showing off that hall of fame resume a little early if you're tim wasn't enough to get him the win ring that bell the winner and still champion of the fight randy character the fight is driven by car shield plans to fit any budget visit carshield.com today I'm sorry, Tim. You got so close, but Randy Carricker just edged you out. He beat you three to two today in the fight. Yeah, yeah. Well, good fight. Yeah, very good fight. Good especially run, a, yeah, a great run considering the way you forced the the tiebreakers. Let's go through the answers here. Happy birthday to Chuck. The round mound a rebound. Charles Barkley. It was the Suns. His first year with the Suns in '93. Both of you hit that right on the head in the 2006 World Series. It, listen. Late October 2006 was not a good time for Brandon Inge. Not only was he the last out of the World Series, but three errors oh. across that series for Brandon Inge, which MLB Stadium is the oldest. It was, in fact, Fenway Park, which opened two years before Wrigley, 1912 and 1914, respectively. I also just liked the synergy of that question, having a Dodger Stadium, a Fenway Park, and a Wrigley Field. I just love that. <laughs> and who owns the Blues single-season record for shutouts by a goalie with nine? He owns the career record for the Blues, and he also owns the single-season record. Is in fact, Moose Brian Elliott with nine in the 2011-20. 12 season so he just edged you out with the Fenway Park question there Tim great job the last three days I appreciate it guys thanks for having me on thank you Tim we enjoyed it and uh, congratulations on a really good run my dog is named after Moose Elliott so. that's what I figured that would be a <laughs> layup for you I thought the, uh, the the one that you went with uh, with Curtis Granderson I thought that might be right Remember he yeah. had the, he slipped, slipped in, yep. in center and David Eckstein may have that may have propelled him to the MVP of that I think so that yeah. series it would have been he or Scott Rowland you know it was interesting Detroit swept the ALCS and I think that had a part of them having all that downtime and we're seeing that now if you finish mm -hmm. top in your division and you have downtime going into the playoffs it just it just seems like you lose a little bit of the edge absolutely that hurt the Dodgers last year against Arizona without question and the Atlanta Braves yep it did I remember the Detroit was so dominant remember USA Today said that they were going to sweep it and win it in three <laughs> yes I remember according uh, to baseball reference Grand is not tagged with an error. He did, on the other hand, go two for 21 for a 0 95 batting average across the World Series. Inge, on the other hand, better at the plate than he was in the field. He did bat 353 across the series. He also had the uh, final strikeout yes. to end the yeah. series, Thank too. You, Adam. Yeah, Adam Wainwright yeah. closed out every series of that uh, postseason. Yep. Uh, coming up here on 101 ESPN, we've moved to John Denton. He was going to join us at uh, what time? What? 9.30. Oh, uh, so what if Mason Wynn isn't ready to be the Cardinals shortstop? What do the Cardinals do then? That's next on 101 ESPN.
I talked to you a lot about Hoffman Brothers. We're a member of the Hoffman Brothers Protection Plan, and it's a really cool thing because they'll call you and set up an appointment. You don't have to call and be proactive. They'll call you and say, hey, when do you want to get your furnace checked out? When do you want to get your air conditioner checked out? They'll make sure that you have filters for your furnace and air conditioners all throughout the year, and you get priority. So if you have an emergency, you're going to go to the head line if you are a member of Hoffman Brothers Home Protection Plan. Not only is Hoffman Brothers great in terms of dealing with them for your home needs, heating, air conditioning, plumbing, electrical, they do everything. But right now they're hiring HVAC professionals and some of their great benefits include free health, dental and vision. They've got eight paid holidays a year. They've got company provided uniforms that include shirts and zip ups, coveralls and winter jackets and annual tool credit. You can come to work for Hoffman Brothers, your American standard heating and air conditioning dealer, and you will be working for one of the best companies in town. Hoffman Brothers, find them on the web at HoffmanBros.com. You can apply there, H-O-F-F-M-A-N-N, HoffmanBros.com, or give them a call, 314-664-3011, 314-664-3011, Hoffman Brothers. Dot com. Opening drive on 101 ESPN. Training, uh, spring training is underway for the Cardinals, and they're closing in on playing their first game. And they have really put their eggs in the basket of Mason Wynn, who only had 130 at bats last year. He he's certainly far from a finished product. But what happens if it is determined that Mason Wynn is not ready to be the Cardinal shortstop, whether on opening day or two weeks into the season, if they think, like they did with Jordan Walker last year, this guy needs a little bit more seasoning at the minor league level. Then what happens? I think it's a moot point. It, I would give it till the first month of the season, and if he's batting like 100, mm -hmm. then I would say, okay, we got a serious issue on our hands. I think he could have two hits in spring training is still going to break – north with the club just because of what you said there's not a lot of options plus maybe he puts a lot of pressure on himself in spring training but he will be the opening day shortstop in my mind now what would happen if he got hurt now that's a question does tommy edmund then have to shift to shortstop how about for mean you know i mean you got a couple options but like you said randy they put their eggs in this basket i would prefer that just saying theoretically and that it did happen in your situation that you're talking about dan i would prefer to have tommy edmund as your shortstop because that seemed like that was the original plan remember last spring training tommy edmund was supposed to be your shortstop and then paul de young was there he became your shortstop now you have mason win in this situation i think that they will give him time though because you have to offensively that was such a small sample size that we saw him last season that you have to give him a longer leash going into this year no doubt but we thought that Jordan Walker was performing pretty well last year and they didn't like what they saw and he got sent down and he's That's a more true. highly regarded prospect than the Mason Wynn is here's the one thing that I would hate is if if they decide okay Mason Wynn has to go down for two weeks just to get straightened out and this happens I don't want to mess with more than one position. I'm with you. So, for example, I, I don't want to move Donovan over to short and then have to risk the health of Nolan Gorman playing second base. And they're worried about his back bending over every uh, all the time at second base. And, and they don't, and the Cardinals look at him at Gorman as an average at best second baseman. So that to me would really compromise your defense up the middle. I think too, you if it came down to this, and this is a big what if and. You know, God forbid for the Cardinals, they, they say we're not even approaching this situation. But let's just say it happened. 
you also could go out on the trade market and get a lesser offensive player mm -hmm. with major league experience that you know can handle the position defensively. I mean, you, there are guys out there that are out there that you could go get, and I would imagine that would be the direction they'd go because I don't think that they want to mess with the outfield. I think that they're saying Tommy Edmond is our everyday center fielder. We don't want Brendan Donovan going much to the outfield because he hurt his arm last year. I think he, one of the things that happened last year, he had so many players playing out of position it was tough to get a fluid situation defensively and I mm -hmm. think it really cost them as they went forward and you don't want to see that happening again because that I just felt like led to a lot of the deterioration that we saw with fundamentals with things defensively for the Cardinals is because you did have so many different situations play out and that's why we're talking about this is because I feel like last season we saw so many scenarios play out that you weren't expecting does this also speak to possibly the infield depth that the Cardinals have or lack thereof Good point. I mean, who's going to play shortstop when you need a day off for um, Tommy? I guess for me, would be a guy that you'd look at. There's others that you could, if it's only a day, you can get away with a day. Yeah, yeah. and uh, you can play Donovan at short for a day. They, he's, yeah. he's played shortstop. Uh, one thing I'm not worried about is if you have to move Tommy Edmond in from center field and have him play shortstop the next day, I'm not worried about him at all. He can handle that. Mm -hmm. And then you you can play Carlson in center field. So if you want to do that, you can. To your point, Dan, about free agents, though, there's some pretty good guys still out there. And the, the, during spring training, these guys will not be available anymore. But Ahmed Rosario is still out there. Tim Anderson is still out there. He was offered, apparently, by the Marlins a couple of days ago, but decided not to sign with them. Uh, Nick Ahmed is still out there. You talk about a defensive guy. He's a former gold glover. Uh, Adelberto Mondesi, the former Royal shortstop. He can play defense. And Kike Hernandez is still out there. Yeah. So there are plenty. You can find somebody. Yeah, if, if you determine early that you need more depth than Fermin or Buddy Kennedy can provide, there's veterans out there that you can bring in to play the middle infield. And I'm also expecting a really good season from Mason Wynn. I think that he's obviously young. He'll have some time, but you saw what he was able to do at the minor league level. There is a lot of talent there, and I'm excited to see what he'll be able to do. It's just giving him time to continue to grow because it was such a limited spot that he was in last season. I also, we mentioned this yesterday, Dan, I don't think that Ozzie Smith goes out of his <laughs> way to talk about a player in a positive light like that. He had mentioned that what he sees in Mason Wynn is a player who is willing to put in the blood sweat and tears which is something that not every single player wants to do at times hell i've been down to fantasy camp with ozzy i put him at short he's still <laughs> yeah. picking yeah, yeah. There you go. 69 years old yeah. and getting around yeah. like you wouldn't believe but um going back to the point i i think though there are probably if you look at teams on the major league level too if you wanted to go out and trade for a veteran shortstop they are there may not be ideal mm -hmm. but they are there to go get and i i, I just don't think that they want to move tommy edmund i i don't don't think that that's something that they want to do and, and start shifting players around the diamond no I, I don't think they want to and I think they're concerned about it I you know Tommy he's not concerned about it Tommy Tommy would have no problem he's just a ball player and so if, if you can play him in center field Same one day with Donovan just yep, a ball yep, player yep just play him at second the next day short the next day it, it doesn't matter to them they just want to go out and play you just if you're the Cardinals you're thinking man Mason win have a solid spring and if you look at his track record he's gone for, and don't get hurt but he's gone from double a to triple a took him a little bit to adjust and I would assume triple a to the major leagues that will be the same thing that happens with uh, Mason Wynn. He had 137 plate appearances last year and hit 172. If he would hit 172, I would think the runway for him to get it right would be a number of weeks as he continues yeah. to de uh, develop at the plate. And I don't expect him to have uh, much deficiency or any deficiencies um, defensively. I think he's going to be just fine. We got a question from the 618, and this is just kind of bi bigger picture probably down the line. But what about Thomas the JC being a possibility? The one thing that I've heard about Thomas to JC is that he does not have a very strong arm. And they're really concerned even about like a second base arm turning the double play. Yes. So I'm not so sure that he would, uh, I'm pretty sure that he wouldn't be an option at short. But uh, I think they have, the Cardinals have a concern about his long-term viability because of his, his throwing arm. The one thing about win too, you don't want a player to get buried. 
That, that's mm-hmm. something that mentally guys come up to the major leagues and if they don't have initial success, you just don't want them to have the issues mentally where they're like, man, I, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying, I can't get over the hump. And that's one of the issues that you can have with a young player. And again, I think the runway for him is going to be very, very long and to get him on track. From the 618, are we really concerned about a guy that bats eighth or ninth? Why does this matter, guys? I, I because look at it, can, things can fall apart offensively. It doesn't right. matter. Well, yes. and we've talked about it. As much as we love Tommy Edmond, Tommy Edmond has not proven himself to be a very substantial offensive player. So all of a sudden, if you have two guys, if you're eight and nine are out, in this day and age in baseball, you can't have that. You need hitters. What would happen if um, Mason Wing gets hurt and you have to go to Tommy Edmond and coming out of spring, you're looking at Victor Scott and he's tearing it up? and play him in center. I, I just some I'm throwing out there. Again, <laughs> yeah. I think that's a last option that they want to deal with at this point. I think they want to continue with Victor Scott getting better and better and having success at AAA. But when you're in that position, I think any option is open. I talked to Victor Scott last month at the writer's dinner. I interviewed him for the writer's dinner. There's a lot of Vince Coleman there in terms of the confidence. Now, obviously, it's there for this base stealing. And of all of the... All of the center fielders in all of minor league baseball, he's the one that won the gold glove. So defense is there, right? 1,800 players in minor league flat baseball. Flat out fly, yeah. too. There's, there's nine gold glovers, out of, and out of 18 players, he won the gold glove. But he said, I asked him what his goal is for 2024. He said, well, it's to make my major league debut. Just very matter of fact about it. And so if you need to plug in a great defensive center fielder, a guy that can get it, that has great bat-to-ball skills, I think that's a really intriguing idea. It's just something I'm throwing out yeah, there. No, you know, <laughs> really intriguing. Yeah, you I, have to. You have to think of all possible situations because we know that the Cardinals are doing that as well. Yep, absolutely. And I, I just, I think the Cardinals are saying, Mason, win, have a solid spring, get mm-hmm. off to a good start, then we don't have to worry about it. Just let him play. Just yep. let him play. And uh, Dan, I want to uh, touch on one other thing that you mentioned, and that's the growth over the to- over time of Mason, win last year. 650 OPS in March, 608 in April, but then 799 in May, 762 in June, in July 1.177 OPS, then a 941 in August before he got called up. So he does ascend as he adjusts to a level. Making some adjustments, yeah. I think we'd say. And again, if he struggles, they're going to give him a long, long runway to get right and uh, how far that would be would be dependent on how much he's getting buried at the major league level because you can't have young players come up and for a month and a half hit 100 you just can't have that okay one other thing and Brooke I think is on board with this Uh, and you are somebody that I, I respect the opinion of He's from Kingwood, Texas. I've given him the moniker, the Kingwood Cannon, because he has such a great arm. And because he can hit. He can hit the ball hard. Mason Wynn, Kingwood Cannon. Thumbs up. Thumbs up. I'm down. I'm down on it. No. The Commerce Comet. We had Mickey Mantle was a Commerce Comet. Just let him get settled in the major leagues first before you give him a nickname. But sometimes the nickname can really just add to the story and propel him even more so. He doesn't need any more pressure from Randy and Brooke to live up to this (laughs) incredible nickname that you've given him. The King would... You, but you think it's an incredible nickname? <laughs> he, he did say that. He just I heard did. him say that. I think it would take a few <laughs> years, though. I, I'm giving this a long runway, too. I don't, I don't think he'd come out and put this on a young player just yet, Randall. We just like to make nicknames. We really do. Arm. He does have a hell of an arm. He's got, he throws triple digits across the diamond. (laughs) So, yeah, you're right. It is a cannon. Yeah. Uh, Coming up here on 101 ESPN, we've got our rush hour reset. And has Scott Boris finally overplayed his hand? That's next on the opening drive on 101 ESPN.
Hey, it's Danny Mac. Want to tell you about Stewart's American Mortgage. You have heard him all across the diamond and all across our dial. Everywhere you go, it is Stewart's American Mortgage. If you're someone who is looking to purchase a home or refinance, or if you're looking to consolidate some of that ugly credit card debt, maybe you don't know exactly what direction to go in any of these things. Let me make it easy for you. Call Stewie from Stewart's American Mortgage. He will help you every step of the way. If it's a new home that you're looking to purchase, he will get you to the closing table fast. Try 10 days. He'll get you the best interest rate possible. He also has the bagel loan. You hear that all the time that can help you out too. What's the bagel loan? If you borrow 200000 or more, there's no underwriting fees, no appraisal fees, no title fees, no lender fees, no closing cost. Stewart is your guy. He makes it easy. Any questions on rates, the industry, the trends, give Stewart a call. Call him directly on his personal cell phone. You can text him, call him. He'll answer you back. 314 324-4440, or you can Google the bagel loan. NMLS number 226715. Having the biggest sports stories of the day on the opening drive with a rush hour reset. It is time for the Rush Hour Reset at 9.02. Time check brought to you by Clarkson Jewelers, an officially licensed Rolex jeweler. Blues falling to Toronto yesterday, 4-2 at Enterprise Center, a President's Day matinee. And the Blues will play the New York Islanders Thursday night over at Enterprise Center. Mizzou Athletic Director Desiree Reed francois bolting for Arizona. So Mizzou in the market now for a new athletic director. And St. Louis City opens their season tonight. They play Houston in the CONCACAF Champions Cup Round 1. It's a 7 o'clock game over at City Park, and we're going to talk to the president uh, and GM of City SC, Diego Gigliani, coming up in our next segment here on 101 ESPN. But as baseball spring trainings open and all of the Cardinal players are in, there's still four notable players that aren't in camps now. Left-handers Jordan Montgomery and Blake Snell, who is the two-time Cy Young Award winner in the National and American League. He won the National League Award last year. And Matt Chapman, third baseman, who played for the Blue Jays last year, and Cody Bellinger had a nice bounce back year for the Cubs. The common denominator among those four players that aren't in camp is that they're represented by Scott Boris. And around baseball, and Ken, Ken uh, Rosenthal at The Athletic has an interesting piece up today. Around baseball, it appears as if teams are saying that uh, they're our general managers are saying that their teams are set. Rangers GM Chris Young, I don't think there are any additions coming at this point. Blue Jays GM Ross Atkins, at this point, additions that would be of significance would mean some level of subtraction. Giants president of baseball operations Farhan Zaidi, it's a little bit more disruptive to add at this point. And you know, anybody who's a free agent, we've theoretically had three and a half months to figure out a deal. And if it hasn't happened yet, at some point, at some point organizationally, you just need to turn the page and focus on the players that you have. The Yankees, if they paid Blake Snell $40 million for this year because of the luxury tax, it would cost them $84 million. Mm. So I wonder if, at, and I don't know, I just wonder if this is finally the year where Scott Boris has overplayed his hand as an agent. This is definitely the owners saying that we don't want to deal with this anymore. Isn't that the feeling that you guys have? I thought this was very interesting, too. Jesse Rogers of ESPN tweeted this out yesterday. Tom Ricketts, the Cubs owner, he said on Scott Boris, I don't talk to Scott. One of his signature moves is to go talk to the owner. When you do that, you undermine the credibility of our GM, inserting yourself into that negotiation. I don't think that helps. I don't talk to him. It really does sound like the owners 
are taking a stand against Scott Boris at this point. And the Cubs have said that uh, Christopher Morrell will be at third base. Mm -hmm. So if you look at that, where does Matt Chapman go? I always look at big market teams, and they seem to be set, with the exception of the Yankees, but the Dodgers, the Braves, the Astros, the Cubs, the Mets, Red Sox, Phillies, Dodgers, they're all kind of set. So and where do these guys go? The other part of it that Scott Boris says is we don't have a salary cap. He's very proud of that. But most teams, especially with the the luxury taxes, they have a built-in salary cap. The Cardinals have a budget. That's a salary cap. Even the Yankees, if they say, and they aren't saying it, but we know it, they're going to spend $40 million on a player if it's going to cost them 84 to sign said player. The Dodgers aren't going to go out, and they've added a billion dollars worth of players, more than a billion already. Are they going to go out and sign one of these guys? I just wonder where that's going to come from. Mike Trout, by the way, saying that uh, he's pleading with Artie Moreno to yeah. go out and sign free agents, and he also says, I don't think it's going to happen. I think if you're Mike Trout, you're doing the right thing and saying everything properly, but he's got, we were talking about this before the show, he's 32 and has seven years and roughly 200 and 260 million. <laughs> I think he's saying the right things, but I mean, do you, if you're Mike Trout, do you trust in your owner to go uh, make the, any kind of moves of significance? Now he signed Albert a few years ago, obviously. He had Shohei Otani, but man, that's a tough spot to be. I mean, because they need a ton of talent around him to make them any better. Why would you pitch to Mike Trout? And why if you are a team and i don't know where they stand from a salary from a, a luxury tax standpoint but there's one team that should sign both montgomery and snell and here's a question that i have for you two if one or the other signs if montgomery gets a five-year deal for 130 million dollars with team a doesn't Blake Snell say to Scott Boris, well, why didn't you sign me there? I think I was going to mm -hmm. go the other way. I agree with you. I was going to say that Snell sets the bar, mm -hmm. and then Montgomery gets whatever teams think would be under that. The thing about Blake Snell, and he's won two Cy Young Awards, and that's exceptional, but he walks five per nine. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't give you innings, right? Yeah, he's, he's averaging about five innings a, a game. Right. But, you know, but, there's, there's reason behind this. Yeah. My, my point is there's only it, – it's a game of musical chairs. Exactly. So I, I'm wondering when the music stops, one of those guys is going to be standing, and they're, they're going to point at Scott Boris, you'd think, and say – Okay, you got him his deal. Why, why don't you have me my deal? And I've never have met Blake Snell personally, so I can't exactly speak to how he's probably feeling in this situation, but you guys have been able to be around Jordan Montgomery. I can't imagine that he is thrilled with the situation right now of waiting to be with the team, getting started in camp, especially for pitchers. That routine is so important to them getting off to a good season and a healthy season. I bet Scott Boris is telling these guys, wait for an injury mm -hmm. and – wait for desperation by clubs and he's telling them here's the particular clubs that we think could be desperate to sign you and these guys buy in and i don't necessarily blame them scott boris is the best agent whether you like him or not in the sport he's getting them massive amounts of money and so the guys buy in and say, okay, I'll hold out and I'll try to get the best deal I can. But is this for the better, and I do agree with you, but is this good for the game? No. And I, I think that they need to have a deadline on free agency. Because yes. yes. this is taking too long and there are a ton of players that aren't represented by Scott Boris that are still looking for jobs. Mm -hmm. I think it'd be good for baseball too. Fans would be interested, which is what you always want. You want to make sure that you uh, get the fan interest because when free agents start, it's like, oh, my team can add this player and that player, and then nothing happens for a month. I, I don't mm -hmm. think it's a bad thing to say free agency is going to have a deadline in baseball. I think it would be a good thing. One other note about Jordan Montgomery. He, he apparently was on record as saying he wanted to go back to one of the teams that he had played for before, right? Cardinals, Rangers, uh, Yankees. If you're Jordan Montgomery, and I, he's 30, so maybe he's going to get the five-year contract but he's looking at marcus stroman getting 37 over two from the yankees wouldn't you ask your agent okay i wanted to go back to the yankees why don't we have a deal like that or similar to that mm -hmm. I, my guess would be he'd say it's only two years and yeah. we can get you at your age this is the big bite of the apple let's get you five let's get you six that would that would only be my response to that randy and I, i'm with you Maybe the two years and the $37 million kind of sets the bar a little bit with him. But in my opinion, I, I think they're waiting for Snell to go, and then that sets the 
the bar for left-handed pitching that's left. The longest contract for a player this year, that a pitcher that moved to a different team because Nola signed for seven years to stay in Philly. But it was the four years that uh, Rodriguez got to go to Arizona, four years and $80 million. Otherwise, there wasn't a deal longer than three years for a starting pitcher. This has just been such a drab. I, I'm trying to think of the right word to describe this off season. I was expecting just so much excitement, things to be moving quickly, and for it to still be kind of drug out in this way is just, I, I didn't, I haven't enjoyed it. I was expecting a more exciting off season. I, I was think that too. every year. Well, and this is what happens. But yeah. this is also the issue with Boris having four of the top ten guys. Exactly. Yeah. And those That's four, here we are. Spring training is underway, and it's hard to join a team in spring training. We've seen a lot. Even Loesch got off to a, a rough start when he joined the Cardinals midway through spring training, a Boris client. Dallas Keuchel. Dallas Keuchel, uh, when Greg Holland signed at the end of spring training. It's not an easy thing to do for a pitcher, especially. Yeah, just to jump in and yeah. say, let's go. Yeah, because, I'm with you. And the team is saying, well, we gave you this amount of money. We expect you to be able to go. Sure. sure. And Boris is telling them, hey, my guy's working out at my camp. So th they expect that they're going to have that guy. And then all of a sudden, that guy isn't the guy that they thought they were paying for. You can throw on the side all you want. It's still not the same as even going down to spring training. And guys are throwing on the side, and maybe it's more tinkering with the pitch. But when you get into those games, there's competition. And if you don't have competition, it just takes you down a rung or two that you need to have that to get the juices flowing. So it's something to keep an eye on. We'll keep an eye on it for you. The date that Scott Boris's guys finally signed. That's today's Rush Hour Reset here on 101 ESPN. Coming up. Our friends at St. Louis City SC get things going tonight against the Houston Dynamo CONCACAF Champions Cup over at City Park. And we're going to talk to the president and GM of St. Louis City SC, Diego Gigliani, here on 101 ESPN.
It's amazing how fast this year's already going by, and we are closing in on Arch Madness. The State Farm Missouri Valley Conference Men's Basketball Tournament over at Enterprise Center, March 7th through 10th, and it is going to be fantastic. Right now, we've got a tie atop the Valley. Drake is 22-5 and five overall, 13-3 and three in the conference. Indiana State, 22-5, and 13-3 and three in the conference. Two of the top 30 teams in the country, and then you have Bradley and Northern Iowa and SIU that all cause a uh, big ruckus and are capable of winning that tournament. All you need to do if you want to get in on one of the best events on the St. Louis sports calendar is go to archmadness.com, archmadness.com, and they have a great family pack that you can get. Four tickets, four popcorns, four large drinks, all for 100 bucks, and you can take your family to enjoy the 30th edition of Arch Madness, the Missouri Valley Conference Men's Basketball Tournament over at Enterprise Center. Again, it's March 7th through 10th. All session tickets are available right now. Single session tickets available as well at archmadness.com. Don't miss one of the great events on the St. Louis sports calendar. It's Arch Madness, March 7th through 10th. very happy with the squad we've got we're very happy with squad. I mean, you know we, we got the players in that we wanted in the position that we wanted the positions that we wanted to reinforce uh, and with regards to uh, Nico's exit which was unplanned and that of course we're very proud of him and and think he's gonna do great uh, in, in Italy and we wish him lots of success hopefully a promotion so he can compete in Serie A um, but on that one specifically is the only case where we are considering more what is the best thing to do and right now the view is that we are happy with the squad that we've got. You're tuned to the opening drive on 101 ESPN. Brooke Grimsley, Dan McLaughlin, I'm Randy Carricker, and that is the voice of the president and GM of St. Louis City SE, Diego Gigliani, and his team gets things started tonight with CONCACAF, CONCACAF Champions Cup action over at City Park. Diego, welcome to uh, 101 ESPN. It's great to have you with us. How are you doing this morning? Doing great. Thank you. Good morning to you and to all your listeners. I, I want to start with this, Diego, because you mentioned the, the players that departed. Based upon what you have seen so far in training camp and prepared for the season, how do you feel you've been able to replace those guys? I'm really happy with, with the team we've got. I mean, preseason has been overall uh, really important. I think we look less at the results during the preseason as much as we do. Uh, is the squad getting to know each other? Are they getting back to match fitness? Do we have no injuries? All those things are we really look at. Obviously, we want to avoid any any important loss that makes us feel nervous with the squad that we have, but we haven't had any of those. We've had actually several useful wins that help to build some confidence, and we're ready to start today. Now, Diego, I want to start at the beginning of this whole experience of you coming over to the MLS and City SC. When were you first able to see City SC in action, and what did you think? first time that I was able to watch a live match was back in the summer of 2023. I happened to come in for the biggest rivalry that we've got against Sporting KC, and I saw that home win. It was a 4-0 win. It was an amazing crowd, amazing night, amazing results and performance. Uh, so that was the, the first live experience I had. Wow. And was it just exciting to see the reaction, the fan reaction to everything? Yeah, I mean, every step in this journey has really been exciting and uh, and surprisingly positive versus any sort of expectations of what I would have had coming in. That, no, no different. Now, with your experience with City Football Group, you worked with clubs all over the world, including one of the best in the world, and that being Man City. What have you been able to bring over from that experience to City SC within this last year? 
I mean, I think the, the experience that I um, developed over there, I spent 10 years with City Football Group, including Man City and working for over 10 other international clubs that the group has. Uh, and that's just the opportunity to be exposed to different realities, different problems, needing to solve them at scale at multiple clubs in different contexts. And that has given me access to a whole bunch of experiences on the sporting side. You know, I've signed managers, uh, signed and sold players, developed academies. Um, and then on the, uh, on the non-sporting side, on the business side, I've worked on all sorts of problems from building new infrastructure to, you know, selling important partnerships, uh, increasing match day uh, season cards. So I've really uh, had this great benefit of being able to work across all the main problems and, uh, and uh, challenges that, football club or a sports club will have city sc president diego gigliani is our guest on 101 espn so it kicks off tonight this may not be in your lane but i'll ask it anyway what what changes if any uh are coming for fans that head down to the stadium in terms of the game day experience i know you probably don't want to give away everything but what kind of uh atmosphere can we expect here tonight i mean i think the uh, first thing to recognize is that tonight is going to be a champions cup match so there are some things that will look a little bit different because it's a different tournament. Um, it's similarly to Champions League matches in Europe. Uh, the Champions Cup matches here are controlled a bit more experience-wise by the organizer of that competition, which is CONCACAF. So some things will look a little bit different to a usual MLS match. Um, but we still uh, hope to bring the same passion and excitement that our teams bring to all the games. We hope to have the usual lights-out moment um, where you can see our stadium come to life. I know CONCACAF is excited to see that because they've seen it only on, on TV. So some things will definitely look similar, uh, but there will be some things that tonight will look a little bit different because it is a different tournament. And Diego, how big of a deal is it? How much of an honor is it for City SC to be involved in this Champions Cup tournament? You know, it's, a, it's a huge honor. I mean, I, I think sometimes uh, we are also needing to make sure that we are helping to explain to all of our fan base what this tournament is about and how important it is that we are in it. Now, there's some people around the organization here that walk around and say that this is probably our most uh, significant match that the team has ever played. Now, this is a regional competition. You don't always qualify for this competition. It is a really uh, difficult competition to win. It's only been won by MLS teams or U.S. teams on three occasions in almost 60 years. So for all of those reasons, it is an incredibly exciting time for the team, for the players, and hopefully also for the fans. I'm assuming with your resume that we talked about earlier that you and Lutz probably ran around in some of the same circles and interacted with each other. What has it been like, though, working with him? It's been terrific. I mean, I think uh, coming in and uh, knowing of his background, I've been starting to see not just what he did last year, but also the year before with the Next Pro team. And then once I'm able to arrive and really work with him uh, day by day, I can see the huge value added that he has brought to the team and to the sporting area. I mean, I think it's impossible to have had a, a season as successful as last year without Lutz having done an amazing job. Do I would say that it's a, uh, it, you know, it's a really big shared responsibility. Bradley has a lot to say. Players have a lot to say. And of course, Lutz is the architect behind all of that. So, so super happy to be working with him, and, and we're, we're glad to have him. Diego, you've worked all over the place. What's it been like for you just to be in St. Louis on a personal level, maybe away from uh, the soccer club? Just what's it like being uh, here in the Gateway City? Everything people told me about St. Louis is true. Um, I tried to find out as much as I could about what it was like to live here because I'd never been here before. Obviously, I didn't have much of a perception of St. Louis before arriving but I've heard a lot of very consistent things in the process. And since living here now for six, seven months, I can confirm that, you know, it's an amazing place to live. Uh, I'm here with my wife and two young kids. It's wonderful for families. Everyone is very settled. People are very friendly. So, no, no, can't, can't be happier about uh, the decision to be here. And I'm proud to be part of St. Louis. And, Diego, we were together over at the, the Baseball Writers' Dinner last month, and you told us about how you were, made it a point to get to a Cardinal game soon and took the kids to the zoo. Now, we always try to sell free agents in any sport on the free St. Louis Zoo. What do you think? <laughs> well, my kids have been three or four times. My wife and the family is a member, but I haven't been able to go yet. Okay, but I'm sure you've gotten good reviews, right? 
So, good. Hey, uh, best of luck tonight and best of luck this season, Diego. Thanks so much for the time, and I'm sure that we will visit again soon. We appreciate it. Thanks so much. I hope to see a lot of you guys over at the game tonight. It's going to be good weather. There's still some tickets available, and hopefully we'll start the season with a win. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. And good to know the tickets are available at stlouiscitysc.com. That's great. I'm shocked. I, I'm I'm shocked. There's two tickets still available. That became one of the hardest uh, tickets to get last summer. Yeah, so let's sell that out, folks. Absolutely. Really, the free zoo question, Randall. <laughs> well, he talked about it. He 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 talked about it when we spoke when when we first met. He you know he listens to the show. He knows yeah. about. Uh, I don't know if he knows about us trying to sell free agents on the zoo, <laughs> but uh, we talked a lot about. That was him. maybe a little bit of a reach. <laughs> Free agents at a free zoo. We did. It. We tried with Aaron Nola, but he was he's stuck on the stupid Philadelphia zoo. He, he didn't bite, huh? No, not at all. No. no. It just slipped casually into yeah, the conversation. It, it slipped very yeah. casually. We were doing subliminal messages over here, Dan. Yeah. But I do love the way that Diego has dove into the St. Louis scene and the St. Louis sports scene and gotten to know this area. And if you have that experience, 10 years dealing with Citigroup and is dealing with a man city, you know how to build a championship soccer club. Yeah, just listening to him list off of everything that he has worked on, it's very exciting. And when I first heard the news that Carolyn Kendall was kind of stepping away into a different position, she, of course, is not completely gone from this organization. It's important to note that. But he's taking more of that other side with it. I was a little bit worried at first, but then when you see, you knew that they were going to have a home run hire, Diego, with him coming in and having that relationship with Lutz. It's very exciting to see what they're going to be able to continue to build. Did you see how many tickets? there? So I did look it up so for today and it's at seven they start from 35 dollars okay that's let's not bad sell it out let's yeah. go let's, let's get some tickets for st louis city sc and houston dynamo tonight over at city it'd be Park. the dynamo oh okay. yeah not dynamo not dynamo <laughs> dynamo randall <laughs> okay Sorry. So you got a zoo, a free zoo in this, and you got Dinamo. Dinamo. Yeah. Coming up, we're going to head down to Florida. John Denton, our buddy from MLB.com, who covers the Cardinals, is going to join us. We'll talk some ball next on 101 ESPN. All right, so I'm going to prepare a, a carrot cake for my buddy Dan McLaughlin. I promised it for yes. a month, and he, he needs it. So I'm going to head on over to Schnooks today, as a matter of fact. And Brooke gets one, too, and so does Matthew. Everybody Whoa. everybody gets one. Brooke always, so Brooke complains about me making cakes and giving her candy, and then she wants it when I offer it. <laughs> so we'll, <laughs> we'll see. But I'm going to – I always use the Schnooks Rewards app. I get 2% back on everything that I buy. So I go into Schnooks, and I, I go use the Depair one, and it's really – cool when you put your list into the schnooks rewards app because your phone will actually guide you through the store so when i know where to go to get the shredded carrots and i know where to go to get the buttermilk and the flour and the sugar and the eggs and everything that i need whatever you put on your list you're going to be guided by the schnooks rewards app through the store to make your shopping experience as efficient as possible so that you don't have to 
go all the way down to row 10 and then come back and say, oh, I forgot something on row three. Nope, it's all set up for you so that you can have an easy shopping experience when you go to Schnooks. And with that Schnooks Rewards app, you get 2% back on everything you buy. So eventually you'll get up, they'll say, hey, do you want to use that 20 bucks? And you say, yeah, I'll, I'll buy my groceries today with my Schnooks Rewards. Download the Schnooks Rewards app and get everything you need for your carrot cake at Schnooks. This is Rocky with your Sports Center update driven by Johnny Londoff Chevrolet and Johnny Londoff Autoplex. The Blues yesterday falling to the Toronto Maple Leafs 4 to 2 in an afternoon game. They will try to bounce back on Thursday as they face off against the Islanders down at Enterprise 7 and Enterprise Center. It's a 7 p.m. puck drop. You can catch the pregame show right here on 101 ESPN starting at 6 p.m. And tonight, St. Louis City SC is back, but this time it is CONCACAF Champions Cup action as they face off against the Houston Dynamo from the 7 p.m. kickoff tonight down at City Park. That is your Sports Center update driven by Johnny Londoff. Find your roads and shop 24 7 at Londoff.com and LondoffAutoplex.com. Are you kidding me? Danny Mack, Randy Carricker, and we head down to Florida. Jupiter is where the Cardinals are in spring training. And our friend John Denton, who covers the Cardinals for MLB.com, just go to Cardinals.com and you can read his fine work. He joins us now on the Celebrity Line. Good morning, Mr. Denton. How are you, sir? I'm doing wonderful, Randy. I'm sitting here watching uh, rundown practice right now. And uh, one Ozzie Smith is not too far away. And uh, so it's, uh, you know, it's, it's pitcher's field in practice day here in Jupiter. It's one of the things, to an extent, the Cardinals missed out on, to, to an extent, last year because of the World Baseball Classic. I know that was part of the reason that their fundamentals lacked a little bit, because they just didn't have everybody in camp. It's a different world when everybody is there, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. You know, yeah, last year, guys would show up, and they were here for two days, and then they were taken off. You know, Tommy Edmond had to fly to South Korea, and Lars Newbar had to fly over there as well, flew to Japan. And, you know, so obviously, you know, naturally their focus was distracted. And, you know, you say, well, every team was missing players. Cardinals had 18 guys that were leaving for that, and they were big guys. You know, it was Nolan Arenado and Paul Goldschmidt and Adam Wainwright and Miles Michaelis. It was some of their biggest guys, and Tommy Edmond and Lars Newbar. So, Yes, every team had guys off, but the Cardinals had their main guys off. And I do think it, you know, while it helped uh, grow the game and and all that, it did, you know, kind of bother the Cardinals a little bit having that many players gone. Hey, John, last time that we talked to you, we were discussing your story about the offseason with Sonny Gray, and you watched him and observed him down in Tennessee. And now you're watching him during spring training. What have you seen from him so far? Yeah, Brooke, it's, it's really, you know, eye-opening to see the way – Sonny Gray is in charge of every drill that he runs. Sonny Gray is in charge of every side session. Uh, he has a plan. He's vocal. Uh, the first day, you know, we're out here on that Tuesday, and Sonny Gray gets on the mound. He's a zero-zero count. Uh, get in on his hands, throw the ball inside, make it break back across the plate, and then he does exactly that and you know even after every session he gets the catchers together and he's like this is what i want to throw in this count i'm going to be throwing it down the middle but it's going to end up on the outside corner and you know he, he is in charge of every session uh every young cardinal pitcher sits behind him when he throws he shares his thoughts with them he's the kind of leader that this team wanted you know they knew they were getting a really good pitcher the guy with the third best era in baseball last year i don't think they quite knew how infectious his intensity would be and how infectious how much of a willing leader he would be and he's really opened a lot of eyes in this camp so far 
Hey, John, good to hear your voice. I wanted to ask you about uh, potential of a Paul Goldschmidt extension. And then on top of that, usually there are candidates to be extended in spring under Mo. So part one, latest on Goldie. Part two, maybe some candidates that could be looking at an extension. Yeah, Danny Mac, uh, you know, in November when we're at the GM meetings, that Mo said that that was one of the priorities. They want him around. He's about all the right things. They want him to sign an extension. They want Goldie to finish his career as a Cardinal. In February, Mo said that the group had kind of backed off of that. You know, they want to kind of take a wait and see. I totally think it will happen at some point. You know, you want that guy in your clubhouse. He is every bit the leader that, that you know, that he, we think of him as. Like, he's not afraid to speak up in those settings. He's not a openly vocal guy but he will speak up and you know tell guys the truth and they want him here um you know it may not happen this spring it may not be until 30 games in the season but i do think it's a priority for the cardinals you want paul goldschmidt if you lost to paul goldschmidt you would be looking for another guy just like him so i I do you know while it's pushed down the road a little bit i do still think it's a priority for the team and then on top of that, maybe uh, those that could be extended in this spring. I, you know, it's hard to say, and I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but there are candidates that potentially could be there. Has there been any talk of that, or is there anybody you can think of uh, off the top of your mind that might be an extension candidate? I think Ryan Helsley would be a perfect candidate for that. You know, and there's there's you know there's a reason that he's here early. He's working hard. He's, he's he wants to be a guy who can pitch sixty innings. He wants to be a guy who can pitch back-to-back days he wants to be able to pitch three times in four days uh you know he's expressed to the team that that he wants to be here and uh he's had a really good camp so far and i I think i think he would be at the top of that list that you know if if you want to if you want to believe in ryan helsley like you know you can you can lock him up for the long term and he's kind of in the prime of his career right now so i think he would be at the top of that list John Den with us on 101 ESPN. Another guy that would seem logical to most fans is Jordan Walker because of the Julio Rodriguez and you see the Jackson Churio. It, it seems like the price for uh, Jordan Walker, if you don't sign him now, is only going to go up, up, up. Yeah, you know, Randy, if you look at uh, Bobby Witt Jr.'s numbers as a rookie compared to Jordan Walker's numbers as a rookie, they're very similar. You know, Jordan didn't have the stolen bases, but I think Bobby Witt had 20 home runs and 600 at-bats, whereas, you know, Jordan Walker had 16 home runs and and 350 at-bats or something like that. So the numbers are very similar. Now, where Bobby Witt hit was year two when he hit 30 home runs and stole 65 bases and stuff like that. If if Jordan could make that leap this this season and have a really good second season, I totally see, could see the Cardinals, you know, trying to lock him up after year two because, you know, you know this kid is on a collision course for greatness. Uh, you know, I always joke he was built in a in a lab somewhere, <laughs> six six, two hundred fifty pounds, uh, great intelligence, great maturity. You know he's going to be a star. So if he has a big second year, who knows? He, maybe he could get that. Two hundred eighty-seven million dollar contract, just like Bobby Witt, really is a star. Well, I want to go back to the starting rotation, John, because of their daunting schedule to start the season. The Cardinals seem to be just toying with the idea of using six starters to start the season, saying that they. So, with the fact that they might be using six starters, who do you think that that potential six starter could be as of right now? Well, I think it's going to come down to Matthew Libertor or Zach Thompson. You know, there's. Uh, Ali Marmol said this morning, confirmed it, what we all thought. Uh, the, the split squad doubleheader on Saturday, Zach Thompson's going to pitch one game. Matthew Libertor is going to pitch the other. They're both going to start. We don't know who's going to stay here and who's going to take the bus ride to Port St. Lucie yet. But, you know, those would be the two candidates to uh, to move into that sixth spot. And, you know, they are worried because, you know, they start off the season with – eight straight games, you play four at Dodger Stadium, you play three against Mike Schilt in, in San Diego, come home and play the Marlins. So you, you're playing eight games right off the bat. And I think it's like 13 games in 14 days to start off the season. So, you know, maybe going to that sixth starter and, you know, saving guys early in the season would be a good idea. And I, I really think it's Matthew Libertor's job to lose. You know, he's the guy that has done this before. He's the guy who's shown that high-end potential and, it's going to come down between Zach and, and Matthew Libertor, and one of those two guys will, will win that battle, no doubt. You know, we had a fun conversation about what if, and that's what a lot of this is, what if this happens, guy gets injured, guy is uh, unsuccessful in spring training, and we are talking about Mason Wynn. What would be a, a backup plan, John, in terms of, 
God forbid he gets injured. You never want to see that. Or he is not productive for, let's say, six weeks of the regular season. What would be a backup plan at shortstop that the Cardinals, with what they have right now, could look towards? Yeah, you know, Danny Mack, it's funny you asked that because like 11 minutes ago, I think I just asked Ali Marmol <laughs> who's back at shortstop. I, you know, because they mentioned, you know, just because Tommy Edmond can do it, do you want him to be your backup shortstop or do you want him focusing on center field? And and Ali was, was pretty adamant that they want they, – they view Tommy Edmond as their backup shortstop. And, you know, if this thing goes off the rails and Mason doesn't play well, I think the, the plan would be to shift Tommy to center – uh, shift Tommy to shortstop, and then either use Dylan Carlson or even Victor Scott the second in center field. Uh, you know, I think that's the break glass if necessary plan. They all believe that that Mason's ready for this. That you know, if you look every level he's been at, he's kind of struggled those first six weeks, and then he caught up to the competition and took off. So they think the kid's gonna gonna win the job. But if they don't, you move Tommy Edmond back to short, and then you. You know, you give Dylan Carlson or, or Victor the, the shot in center field. John Denton, last thing for me, and you mentioned how Sonny Gray is kind of taking charge and, and saying what he's going to do. Last year, when the whole kerfuffle with Wilson Contreras popped up, the Cardinals talked about him not really being familiar enough with their processes. Well, now he's got three new starters and other new relief pitchers to learn. Have you been able to observe or find out how they've changed the processes to allow Wilson Contreras to learn the new pitchers? Yeah, you know, a lot of times, Randy, when when, uh, when Sonny Gray's on the mound, it's Wilson Contreras catching his bullpen. When it's Miles Michaelis, uh, you know, it's Sonny Gray. I mean, it's, uh, it's Wilson Contreras catching his bullpen. I can tell you this, even before the players reported, Wilson lives in Orlando in the offseason. He would drive the two hours and come down and catch Miles Michaelis' bullpen. He would drive down and catch Stephen Matz's bullpen, uh, so he was making the effort to, to you know, to build a relationship with these guys. And you know, you see them; they're they're almost inseparable in spring training. But if one of those big horses is on the mound, usually Wilson's going to be the guy catching them uh, in the bullpen. And there's always a skull session afterwards where the pitchers and catchers talk. And man, Wilson's Wilson's been a delight. You can see how much more relaxed he is this year he feels like he's home he feels like this is his spot now so you know i give wilson credit for you know he got here early he made the effort to come down from orlando to work out with these guys he's he's due for a big year because he he took a lot of unnecessary criticism last year and i I really think he's he's gonna you know be the catcher the cardinals need this year as you watch uh, the competitions that are taking place in camp, it looks like the lineup is pretty much set. You know the rotation is. Is there a bench spot, number one, John, that's up for grabs? And then I guess bullpen competition would be first and foremost? Yeah, in the bullpen, there's five spots that are pretty much you could write down right now. You know, you're going to have you're going to have Helsley. You're going to have Gallegos. You're going to have Kittredge. You're going to have Middleton. Um, who's the fifth one I'm thinking? There, there was one more, uh, either Palante or King in there. But there's there's kind of three spots up for grabs in that bullpen. And, you know, it's do you go with the guy who has the funky delivery? Do you go with the guy who could throw multiple innings? Uh, you know, Ali Marmol said this morning, they're going to take the, the best three of that group. But, you know, sometimes the best three is a guy, a righty, who gets out lefties like Palante. Sometimes it's a guy – you know, uh, like Libertor, who can who can be your long reliever if you need. So, you know, those those final three spots in the bullpen are, are one area. And then, you know, do you have Matt Carpenter and Alec Burleson on the on the roster? You know, I mean, they basically both play first base. They, they're DHs, they're lefty bats. Uh, you know, so some of those spots off the bench are, like you said, are, are definitely up in play. Uh, and then the three spots in the bullpen. I'd say that's where the the biggest areas of competition still remain. John, it's 45 degrees right now in St. Louis. Would you recommend that we be in Jupiter, Florida? <laughs> yes, but this is like Florida winter today. I was just talking to somebody. This is like one of the three days in Florida when you actually use the heat. So I think it's two <laughs> here today, and people are acting like it's 32. So it's <laughs> cold comparatively. You guys have it much worse than we do right now. It's it's and beautiful here. I love it. Uh, John, it's always good to hear your voice. Thanks so much for the time. We do appreciate it. We'll talk soon, and we'll see you soon. Thank you, sir. Okay, guys. Take care. Thanks. See you later. John Denton, you can read his great work at cardinals.com. He covers the Cardinals and uh, provides a lot of great, great information, as he just did there. Coming up, we've got rock and roll for you as we head down the stretch on this edition of the Opening Drive on 101 ESPN.
Still looking for new ways to play daily fantasy? Underdog Fantasy's newest Pick'em product is active in Missouri, Pick'em Champions. You just pick two to five players from at least two different teams, select higher or lower on the player stats, and then just like that, you're entered into entry to win your money. It's legal in Missouri. On, to on top of that, it's fun to play as as you watch your favorite teams. No Blues game tonight. City is tonight. So let's get in that soccer feel for the entry we're going to put in today. And I'm going to want to watch some soccer earlier in the day, so I'm going to watch some EPL later on today as I get my afternoon started into my evening before the City game. And like we're talking about City, we talked to Diego Gigliani from the City group earlier. So I'm putting my entry on C Manchester City to get a big win there. You can jump on all their entries. It's super easy to play and even easier to get started. You just go to their easy-to-use mobile app or to underdogfantasy.com and you can put in your entry just like that. And before you do something, Sign up with the promo code ROCC, and our dog will match your first deposit up to $100. Plus, they'll give you a mystery special pick to use on your first pick em entry. That's Underdog Fantasy promo code ROCC to get your first deposit of $10 or more up to $100 match, plus that special mystery pick. Must be 18 plus and present in the state where Underdog Fantasy operates. Terms apply. Concern with your play called Winner or Gambler or visit www.ncpgambling.org. You know, end roll. Let's rock. Let's rock today. Okay, before we get to rock and roll, I gotta tell you guys something. You, guys, you would agree that I'm generally a pretty nice person, right? Generally, I make yes. an effort to be nice to people. So we have this new insurance this year. We have Blue Cross Blue Shield of Minnesota. And I got a letter the last week that said they had rejected a prescription of mine. I've been taking this prescription for eight years. And they, they don't know me from Adam at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Minnesota. And so they send this letter that yeah, the, your prescription has been rejected. You can either appeal by hiring an attorney or having your doctor appeal. And I called up Blue Cross Blue Shield of Minnesota loaded for bear. I was ready to be, I was ready to be a Richard. I wanted to be a Richard. <laughs> this woman answers Andrea and she's so nice. She says, how can I help you? And I said, well, I have a question. I do, first of all, I know that you guys are in business, so I don't know if it's more valuable for you to have me dead or alive. But I have this question about you rejecting my prescription. And she was very nice. And I, I was starting off nice. I was going to be a jerk later. And so she gets all my information. I said, I get this letter, and I read this letter with all this gobbledygook. And she said, well, let me check on that. And she's gone for a minute. She's uh, literally like a minute. And she comes back, and she's... Uh, Mr. Carricker, I'm so sorry for your wait. Here's what's happened. We did actually accidentally send out that rejection letter, but your prescription has been approved. And I said, so the prescription, the approval takes precedence? And she said, yes, it does take precedence. Is there anything else I can do for you? And I said, no, <laughs> you've been awesome. You've been great. Have a great President's Day. I was so ready. I wanted to be a jerk, and she wouldn't let me. She was so good at her job. So kudos to Blue Cross Blue Shield of Minnesota and Andrea. They were fantastic. <laughs> you were just waiting for any 
any opportunity to just jump on her? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I wanted to say, so you're okay with me dying. That's a, that, that's, that, that was going to be a line that I used. You had a line ready to ready, go. Ready to go, and she never even let me use it. So you were loaded for bear, man. I was, man. I was ready to be a Richard. Oh, well, I'm glad you're that never it worked out for the better. Oh, I, I would have been to her. Um, just, oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Chip from Spectrum. <laughs> he got on the yeah. bad side of yeah. Randall. Hello, this is Chip. How can I help you? I said, Chip is not your real name. I started with that. No. And then, yeah, and then uh, it went downhill from there. It was not good. Finally, no. uh, I, I, it was a bad day for me. I was, I was on the phone with these people for an hour. And this was before, by the way, Spectrum had brought all of their call centers here. Okay, so you, Spectrum's customer service has turned around and it's fantastic now but this is when it was bad and finally i got to a point where i said let me talk to an american and uh, i did i did i was really mad and they did they let me talk to an american everything got fixed because i couldn't understand it it was a rough day rock what do you have on rock and roll rock and roll (laughs) i'm sure you can all relate (laughs) text line is open 314-399-9646-314-399 yo Tell me if you can't relate to that. Brooke, take it away. All right. Well, anyways, on foul territory yesterday, Miles Michaelis decided to weigh in on the standoff between Scott Boris and Major League Baseball teams. Here's what he had to say. Why are these guys still out there? Why are they not signed? And why are the Cardinals not signed? What's that set? Who are all those guys represented by? Mm. Some of those guys are notorious Boris guys, and he'll. I know he tells guys things that, you know, you got to hold out for this, and he's... You know, some of his clients have a history of holding out till mid-spring training. Um, So you never know. Guys are asking too much. I don't know what people are asking for. I know what I think people should get, and I know what some people might be asking for. And you hear the the both sides of the story. Like, you know, if a guy struggles for a couple years and then has a great year, they'll tell you, well, he's now he's great. He'll be great forever. But a team is going to tell you, well, he was great for a year, then bad for a year, then great for a year, then average, then great. So are we going to pay him? We're going to give him five years for two years of greatness. Or are we going to get three years? Or is he really going to be great for all five? So there's, you know, there's arguments on both sides. I'm a big both sides of the coin guy. Miles Michaelis just always shoots it straight to you. And I think that he brought up a very fair point on both sides of this, of why we are seeing this continued standoff and why it's taking so long for them to reach some sort of agreement and where you can get these Scott Boris clients to these teams. It's clearly, as he said, even the players know, it's it's a Boris issue. And I wonder, Dan, how many players that Boris represents understand that they're the boss? Hmm. Not many. I don't know if he put a percentage on it. Here's the thing, though. If you're a player, you're saying also, this guy is the best at what he does, and he represents me, so I'm going to put my trust in him. I don't blame them for that. I also think that you're right. There are certain agents in which uh, the players are working for the agent. I don't know if it's with every single one. Like I'd even say with Boris, there's some times where, a player probably says, no, get me here. I'm mm-hmm. good. Mm-hmm. I just don't think it happens very often at all. I was talking to a former general manager last year when the whole Freddie Freeman thing broke about how Freeman wasn't given the information about an Atlanta offer that was subsequently debunked. But this former GM told me that he had a player that was represented by Boris, and he called him, and there was a deadline. The, 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 the team wanted to either have him or not have him, and the deadline was in a couple of days. And he called the player, and he said, hey, what are you going to do? And he said, I don't know. Scott's going to tell me tomorrow. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, give me the best deal. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah, I don't care where it is. Just give me the best deal. I, I think it's hard, though, to begrudge a player for having Scott Boris represent you. I mean, his track record is incredible for the yeah. amount of money mm-hmm. that oh, he gets his players. So. I don't blame a player, but it is frustrating as a fan not to see some of these guys signed and, you know, finish off free agency as we move forward. And that's the biggest thing is that I do understand both aspects of it. And Scott Boris obviously is great for his clients, but 
This is why I think, and Dan, you mentioned this earlier, that the deadline will be helpful because it just helps things move along a little bit quicker where you don't have this just stagnant waiting time on where these guys are going to go. I think with a deadline, too, you put pressure on people. Exactly. You say... And you're still going to make money. Absolutely. And this is why you have a trade deadline is to finish it off, put pressure on people. That's why you have the deadline. And I, I just something I thought about is that maybe you put a free agency deadline out there and it... I think it helps the game, too. You want mm -hmm. interest in your offseason, that's one way to do it. It's it's a smart thing to do because you look at the NBA, you look at the NHL, you look at the NFL. Everybody has a huge day on the start of free agency, right? And everything happens. So why not have that? Why not try to attract more eyes to your sport? Get more people under the umbrella. The hot stove league is something that fans love. Yep. Mm -hmm. It is fun. And you, you've got your hopes up that you might get player X and then you get player mm -hmm. Y and you have disappointment and you get surprises along the way. I, th I just think it's a, a way to keep you front and center with your fan base. A great line from Dan Lebetard that baseball has not embraced yet. Fans like the transaction more than the action. I, I would happen to yeah, agree. They because do. it's the drama, it's the stories mm -hmm. that come around it. And it was Rob Manfred that mentioned this trade deadline, at, or not trade deadline, excuse me, Signed free agency deadline. deadline. And Scott Boris did come out and say that he was not for this. Oh, no, totally so. opposed. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, it's. Uh, I hope his players don't wind up in an unfortunate situation. I don't think they will, but you know, it, the teams are in an unfortunate situation right now because anytime you have a player that joins in the middle of spring training, it's going to be an iffy proposition, probably. And uh, I, I think they 100% put their trust in Scott and say, wherever I wind up, I get the best deal, so I'm good with it. Right. A uh, great job today by our producer, audio, video engineer, the one, the only Matthew Rocchio. Thank you, sir. Pleasure. Uh, Brooke, did you have fun today? Yes. Do you still have your Reese's? Um, uh, it mysteriously it's disappeared. Surprise. We want to see your face. <laughs> <laughs> you want to see my face? Okay, good. I'm glad. I'm glad. I guess somebody just ran in and took it. That's my guess. Yep. Danny Mac, happy ta Taco Tuesday. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Looking forward to it. I'm going to have tacos today somehow. Choco Tacos. Oh, Choco Tacos are back this summer, baby. Can't wait. You're fired up. <laughs> I already am. It's going to be a long time, but I'm fired up. Hey, we thank you for tuning in, texting in, and being a part of the show. We have a balloon party with T-Mac and Ajax coming up. BK and Ferrario back today from 11 to 2, and then the fast lane from 2 to 6. For all of us, until tomorrow morning at 7, have a great Taco Tuesday, everyone. That's right.